Okay, I think. Welcome everyone um, to our Soquel Creek Water District meeting for October 15th. Roll we'll call shows all of the directors present. Um, we have no public hearings. Um, in honor of Vaidehi, I'd like to move item 6.2 up to the very front. Um, do you guys want to start in, add anything? Yeah, if it's okay, I think Melanie and I would like to say a few words. Maybe I'll start it off. So, by day, e. Campbell was a, a colleague of all of, of us staff and, a, and to the board, you know, a, a valuable staff member. And recently, with the boating incident with the conception, she she passed away. And you know, we've been kind of mourning and, and and trying now to turn it into a, a celebration of her life. Um, Vi was the only, by day he um, was the last person to make the hire on my call. Uh, she, actually, the general manager at the time said, interview this guy, and if he doesn't pass muster with you, we won't hire him, and if he does, we will. That's the story I was told, and she was the last one I looked in her eyes, and I, and I remember sitting on the opposite side going, if this is what this place is like, I definitely want to work here. But more importantly, she was the only person in our organization to actually work for three different departments. And I bring that up because engineering, conservation, special projects, and I would even say in, in the admin department, we adopted her because I needed her, I, Emma and I needed her. And I would say, Christine, you probably agree that O&M probably felt like she was part of your department. And the reason why is she had this extraordinary range of talents. and. When you think about what most people know her for is her outreach, you know, all the education and everything. I can't tell you how many times um, we did outreach events together and I was just sharing uh, last week. The last one we did was down at KSC Radio and, I, and they had a band playing and I, re I wanted to dance with her but I, I didn't have the gumption, just not because of vibe but just because it didn't seem right and I, I wished I'd done that. But anyway, she worked for three departments and in conservation she was the outreach princess queen of that and extraordinary top people from K since they were at kindergarten that can vote now I always like to say that in engineering think about the range she did she started the GIS or helped with that maybe Melanie will touch on that but she was she had that technical expertise so this breadth of I don't think hardly anybody in the organization has that uh, uh, range of talent and then under with with special projects and communications taking it to that whole level so you know to have an employee that is that talented that flexible that caring and never did i ever ever hear her once say oh i don't want to do that i don't want to go work in that department or do this she was always like yeah i'm up for that and what i realized was in, in when, when i was managing the conservation department shelly and i we needed help uh, introducing new technologies, you know, these laptops that people were going out in the field work with that they used to only like read a meter by hand and now they were introduced to all this. It was scary, it's scary for a lot of people. Um, I mean, I still relied on her for that <laughs> up till, you know, recently. And, uh, but she had a knack for going around to each person. She was our change agent, that's what she was. She would introduce technology in a way that you did not feel threatened, you weren't scared to ask a question like, you know, that might be so simple, but she had that endearing way, which I don't need to, to go on. Everybody knows she made you feel so comfortable. Um, and she did that with everybody. So she was the person, if we were introducing something, she shared that, she helped the people, got up to speed. I don't know how many times I said, hey, Vi, help, can you help me with this computer issue? And she'd just walk over and do that. So I love her immensely, and I'll, I'll leave it with that and let you say a few words. Thank you for letting me ramble on, but. Thank you, and I'll let you. Um, I, I just wanted to first recognize that we do have some special friends and family members of Vi, so if you guys could just raise your hand and let the board know that you're here. Thank you so much for, for coming today. Um, we, you know, it's tradition of the board to um, do past resolutions in honor of our employees in terms of their years of service or in some instances, unfortunately for this one, it's in memory of somebody. 
And as Ron mentioned, Vi was very special to all of us. For me especially, uh, I hired Vi as an intern when she was in college. Um, her application came through. I was in the engineering department. And she had a, a keen interest in learning about computer systems and GIS. And you know, she was a staunch environmentalist, as she always was to every day that she came into work. And it's been a real pleasure for me to see her grow. Um, I've never felt that I was really a mentor, but to her, I felt that we both supported each other. And she was not only um, a colleague, but also a friend. And I feel that over the last month, um, we at the district have been in a, in a, in a fog. Um, the first day it came out, we had a board meeting. We, I think we all pushed through. Um, and, and that probably was the hardest board meeting of my life. Um, and, and then the next meeting, you know, it was just kind of still acting like, like we could get through it. And I think in this last couple weeks, like Ron says, we've really been able to embrace her and what she meant to us and what she meant to the community. And I'm really excited to um, be able to have President LaHue read this resolution um, that we've prepared. And I'm glad that you guys are here to, to hear it. And please share it with Sarma and the children and, and her father, James. And then we have a, a slideshow and a little short video that we wanted to show by. Okay. And just before I read the resolution, um, my own personal experience with Vi, you know, coming to my class year after year and, and um, bright, kind, and enthusiastic and fun loving. And so, man, if we could all do that, um, the world would be a good place. Um, whereas um, by day he, Campbell and Williams first joined the SoCal Creek Water District family in 1999, spending two summers as an intern engineering assistant while attending Scripps College and earning a bachelor's degree with a double major in environmental studies and French. And whereas I was hired as a permanent employee of the district in 2001, serving as communications GIS program assistant, where she was instrumental in launching the district's GIS platform and becoming the office expert in many of its technology tools. And whereas I was an, is an, as an ardent environmentalist, led the district's green team, helping guide its offices towards a higher level of sustainability. And she was instrumental in the district becoming a certified green business. And whereas Vi became the district's communication specialist in 2017, a position where she enthusiastically shared her passion for water and the environment. And whereas Vi was essential to giving the district a new higher level of visibility throughout the community, becoming well known at local, county, and statewide educational and special events around water issues. And whereas Vi loved working with teachers and students and eagerly provided fun interactive presentations in local classrooms, when she would wear a tiara and call herself the water princess, to the absolute delight of the kids. And whereas Vi was an exceptional communicator and educator on water conservation and recycling, and her commitment to the district mission along with her carefree personality often had her volunteering to wear a water droplet costume at local events, including the Santa Cruz County Fair, Earth Day in the Park, and at the Water Harvest Festival where her vitality and extraordinary people skills engaged kids and adults alike. Whereas during the last two years, Vi maintained a frequent presence in the community with the district's Pure Water SoCal educational trailer, from which she would enthusiastically and patiently describe the project's benefits and features in her own inimitable way that engaged and charmed both children and adults. And whereas Vi was a past president of the Monterey Bay Waterworks Association, was a project water education for teachers facilitator, and was part of the California Water Education Committee, and received the 2008 Water Awareness Wizard Award. And whereas tragically, Vi's life was lost aboard the diving boat Conception on Labor Day off the Channel Islands, and where is Vi's sparkling energy and her boundless exuberance and the immense joy she brought to everyone she met are deeply missed and will not be forgotten. And whereas those at the district who knew Vi will treasure the, their memories of her easygoing, beautiful, kind soul, 
and her positive impact on the district and the community she serve. And whereas Vi's remarkable legacy at the Soquel Creek Water District and the legacy of her life with her family and friends will continue to inspire and motivate those who knew her and who were touched by her kind and giving spirit. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of Soquel Creek Water District does hereby honor and commemorate the life and work of Vaidehi Campbell in memoriam, and be it further resolved that we join by his family and friends in sorrow at this heartbreaking loss, while taking solace in our remembrances of Vi as a vital, dynamic, devoted, and beloved member of the district family. So, we need to vote. I will make the motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So, passed and adopted today. And then. have some slides. When the sound is on, should be. Was that me? <coughs> Did it stop or was that me? We're just going to have to watch that beautiful thing again. <laughs> I think it had actually ended. There, we do have one other um, video that we found and we wanted to play tonight. Um, for many of you who worked with Vi, whenever she went out to a school or an event, she always brought this groundwater model. And she was pretty much the only person here. Maybe Tom knows now how to use it, and maybe Jen and a few others. Um, but it
it was one of the things that I felt she really connected with people, whether they were children or adults, and really helped them understand um, how water is here in our area. And Mrs. Vi doing a demonstration of the groundwater model. coming in it's an amazing model. I know I'm sorry that one didn't work um, but it is on our Facebook page so I encourage you guys to to go and, wa and watch it there um, she always had such enthusiasm for the groundwater model um, in closing of this item Tom thank you I just wanted to reiterate um, and just express how much support that the community has provided to the family as well as to uh, the district family at work. Uh, there is a GoFundMe page that has been set up for the family for any donations that people have asked us, what, you know, how can they contribute? Um, that GoFundMe page, I believe, is still active, so anybody who is watching this on TV, please go and find that. It's uh, under Vidahi Campbell Williams. Um, also wanted to just note that um, the Aptos Times, which has been a local paper here for us ran a beautiful front page cover spread on Vi. Um, it's a beautiful story. And then I, I did want to just close with, um, we do know of two of the organizations that Vi has been really active with. The Monterey Bay Water Works Association, which she is a past president of, is setting up a scholarship fund as well as the Water Reuse California. The details on those are still being ironed out, but I believe one of them is going to be trying to work with Scripps College to get that scholarship through the school. And then lastly, I just wanted to um, highlight that one of Vi's events that she was instrumental in putting on was the Water Harvest Festival, and that is coming up on October 20th this Sunday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. We are putting it on in honor of Vi. And so we encourage um, people who want to come and, and feel her spirit to, to go to the event. Um, we've got a lot of activities. We had many people want to sponsor it to help ensure that there are a lot of children activities because that was what Vi was really wanting to have was a lot of educational booth for children. Um, and the performers that she worked with through the school assemblies are all donating their time to do performances throughout. So I, I think it's going to be a really great event. We're also working with the County Parks Department and taking donations because we will be collecting money to plant a tree in her memory. Um, and, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you for the family for coming tonight and right. for giving us by for those years. Very great. Right. And Becca made, and I don't know, maybe you helped make, there's some yes. to live like like by my day which i really loved because it'll help remind me to to be kind and be enthusiastic and that, um, maintain that attitude so thank you and for members of the family you do not have to feel like you have to stay through the rest of the meeting too it's <laughs> not it, it's not rude to to leave it's okay <laughs> yeah thank you guys what a gift So we will move on to the consent agenda. Um, is there anything anyone would like removed from the consent agenda from the board? Now, I won't be able to yeah. vote on the two items. Two items, yes. So I'd like to remove the like to remove the special. Excuse me, the. Uh, um, 3.4, the production reports. Production reports, okay. I find those. And then 3.11, the okay. contract. Okay. For legal services. 
And since I wasn't at the September 17th meeting, I should probably pull that so that we can vote and I sure. can abstain um, appropriately from that one. 3.1, yeah. Okay. Um, anyone else? And any members of the public that need anything removed from consent? Okay. Sounds good. So um, items 3.1, 3.4, and 3.11 will not be on consent. I move. I move the rest of the items. I'll second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Um, I didn't have any problem with the minutes, um, but um, I just, if you guys want to. I move we adopt the minutes. I'll second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I abstain. Item 3.4, production reports. Yeah, I, I find these very interesting because um, it's a summary of how water is being used in our district. So um, on page 40 of 148, it's showing basically that the water use dropped um, from 2013 to 2014 and then um, has stayed fairly similar in the in the summer months and has ever even decreased during the winter months and um, the other piece of information that's on three that's on 41 and 42 and then 43 Ron, did you, were you the one that came up with this index? I think you might have been. I forget. It's been a while. I know it's been refined over the years. Christine's probably perfected. Yeah, but it, I find it really interesting because there's a weather index. I thought you did. No, I didn't. Okay. Not the details. I wanted <laughs> okay. something. but Sorry. I think it was me, actually. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> it was the other Bruce. Well, yeah. Bruce. It was a Bruce, anyway. Well, thank you for coming up with it because what it shows is back when we started this in 05, they have two different... Um, curves and the weather index indicates summertime and wintertime and but it, it's more exact than that it has um, rainfall and evapotranspiration and then the the production is the index is the production and they're both normalized to one and what it shows is that just how the district has decreased its water use, even in times when the when when there's uh, when it when it's hot and there's a lot of evapotranspiration. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it shows that since 2014, it's been very similar. Um, and I I think it's a testament to our customers who got the message during the drought. Um, there may be some rebound effects that come in the future, but at least as of now, people are uh, treating water as a precious resource. And so I thank you for including these in the, in, in the, uh, the minutes. Any other comments on production? Okay, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I know your report. I'll, I'll note just I think it's important because what I watch out for is how that rebounding or if rebounding has occurred if you go up a, a, up this way um, you do see what you're seeing here go to the, to the total is um, each month for each year and if we go out to September we can see that's the last time it's reported over those years so you can see from the low a slight modest gradual trend back upwards um, it's not perfect, but you see a slow, slow tick, and that's what we want to watch that for sure. Mm -hmm. Something we keep on, but drastically, the summer outdoor usage, our customers mm -hmm. have been rock stars and uh, have really curtailed that, and it's been um, a real gift for preventing seawater intrusion. Yep. All right, so um, we'll go to item 3.11. Bruce, you, had a, you pulled that. Oh, 3.4? Yes, please. Yes, sorry, I thought you were for the next one. Oh, no, I, I do have something to say about this, too. Do your, um, the district has had several very large 
leaks and, and uh, ruptures in their pipeline, do you separate that loss from this production amount? It seems like the volume of, of a ruptured pipe could be substantial and could really affect what you see here. How is, how is that reflected in your production? Is it separated out or what do you do? Okay, th thank, you. thank you. That's a reasonable question. We can probably answer that. Colonel Terry Maxwell, I tried to get your attention regarding 3.2 uh, in which you're indicating environmental science associates. That one we already had voted no, on. No, 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 no. You may have, but I tried to get your attention to comment on it. Well, it, it has to be pulled from consent to order to have a comment period. Well, would you? So I asked for people to pull from consent. Well, I Go ahead. I tried to get your attention, but at any rate, ever so briefly as a customer and an impacted resident of this county, um, in behalf of everybody who's paying to this water district, I find the $313,000 to environmental science associates with no explanation in your public information available at all to justify it. What did they do in support of Pure Water Soquel that justifies another $312,000 going to them? Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to come by your office and see on, on which this is based. And why did you so cavalier fashion pass it? without asking to have the details either here or yourselves. And I ask each board member, have you actually looked to see what would justify this $300,000 expenditure? Apparently you haven't. I find that negligent, irresponsible. It's, it's interesting that you would say apparently we haven't just because we didn't answer you, but that's okay. Have you? No, I, yes, we all read it and we know that it's for uh, environmental impact statement, but you know, we're not gonna get into that. You always assume the worst, Mr. Maxwell. Anyway, I would um, I'd just like to point out that this is an item that had a detailed report on it earlier and yeah. it was approved by the board. Right. So there's details. If you go back into the previous minutes, this is this is not just something that was slipped in. This was yeah. scrutinized by the board and the public had opportunity to talk to, to comment on it at that time. And this is just a, a bookkeeping. Yeah, there's a multi-stage process within the organization to right. review anything like this. Um, Christine, do you want to just address the leakage as far On as? The, yeah, production reports, uh, those monthly reports only include production from our sources. They don't include consumption or an, any other type of water use or loss. Um, water loss is reported annually in our water audit, which is. Which is at the end of this agenda. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Right, so basically it's inherent in what's reported because production is what comes out of the wells uh, yeah and they also includes any imports or exports in okay. those numbers too right okay and then the just for to put things in perspective we've had some large <laughs> leaks but is there anything that's even approached an acre foot um, well some large ones not recently can be 300,000 gallons so that's, that's an one acre, acre foot, foot. Okay. So these numbers are much larger than than that. Yeah. Hundreds of times larger. Yeah. A thousand. A thousand times. times. A thousand, yeah, a thousand times larger. Times. Yeah. Yes. For the year. Yeah. At least three thousand times. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> one tenth of a percent. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. So we'll move on to three point one one um, contract amendment for uh, um, legal services, and you had asked that be pulled. I, I I did. I just wanted uh, Ron to comment. Uh, we had a. Yeah, there's a table mentioned in the attachment to this document. Uh, if the, and if the board, would, it was not included in the packet. It, we have it here. If you'd like to see it, we can just pull it up. If you'd like to see the sure, table, I'd what like the to, table is, like while the total cost is listed in here for the legal services, this is a breakdown of the here. total cost. So let me, let me. Okay, let's switch over here. It's on this page. Okay. So there is the, the total cost is 193. The exhibit in the memo, the attachment to the memo said, exhibit A contains a breakdown of the cost. This is the breakdown of the cost. So if you're interested uh, in this level of detail, we, we certainly as staff want to see this uh, when we create a relationship with any consultant so we can help 
you know, manage that work and relationship. And so it's an hourly rate in each of these tasks. Not take, to exceed. Take time. Yeah. Okay. And, the, and, yeah. Um, thank you. Any other questions from board members on that? Any members of the public on this one? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, that breakdown is not contained in what you released to the public tonight? And what he just said. On your website, is that correct? It is there now. It will be it's there. presented to the public and the board at the same time in real time right now. So, so we have it's not in this handout. Exactly what Mr. Duncan just said. All right, could, you t could I obtain a copy? tonight there it'll be a the copy you're providing is there it's displayed why is it not here hey, I, I didn't know it go ahead we're seeing it the same time you are the actual table so we don't, we don't have a paper copy you don't have a paper copy we all have this right now well I can't even read that one to, to well you can surely anyway. get one later it's fine okay well I will be asking for one later I would ask you suspend approval of those until you give the public a chance to be informed of this, myself and others who are concerned to comment on it. Um, and, and by the way, the fact that you would litigate against Ms. Steinbrenner is just preposterous waste of your resources. You could have simply complied with the California Environmental Quality Act, evaluated all the alternatives that are $100 million cheaper than Pure Water SoCal, and you would have complied with the law. Um, as well as you met other environmental quality obligations that you're ignoring and you're neglecting and your lawyer should have advised you to do that, not waste half a million dollars apparently on legal fees. And by the way, Mr. Basso should be perfectly capable of defending you against Ms. Steinbroner, a nice lady and a non-lawyer non layperson. Instead, this is preposterous waste. It's another example of the profligacy, I'm sorry, of the SoCal Creek Water District directors and some of its management. And the $193,000, absolutely. I, as an impacted ratepayer, I want to see how she justifies it. And I want to see why Mr. Basso couldn't have done that work far cheaper at the uh, retainer fees you're paying him as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbruner. I am the petitioner acting in pro per for the public benefit. I'm not the only one that's complaining. I am really sorry that your ratepayers are being charged this money. It, that's, that's not what I want to do. I want the district to follow the, the rules, to follow CEQA law. And there are many instances I allege that you have not. If the district were to simply go back and address those issues, I would stop. But you continue to press forward with this legal action, and I, like Mr. Um, Maxwell, think that you should postpone approving this because you have not presented the full accounting of to justify the $193,000 until tonight, and that is not proper public notice on such a large ticket item. You're also in the warrants paying um, Best Best and Krieger just in one month, $33,000 for what? <laughs> now I see that in the um, thing here on that I've seen for the first time tonight, Best Best and Krieger is anticipating $40,000 to fight my motion to amend the petition, just to change the petition. $40,000. Not even included in what I see up there is my motion to change venue. So what I want to say is I don't understand why you continue to press forward with these very expensive legal fees. Paying Best Best and Krieger's attorney to fly up every single time from Riverside to attend a court the last two times in court, their counsel virtually said nothing. It was Mr. Basso that conducted the, the opposition. So I really want you to, first of all, postpone taking this action and so that you and your ratepayers and the general public can examine these rates and um, 
bring it back to next time. And I want you to think about what you're really doing here. I don't enjoy this. <laughs> it's hard on my health, it's hard on my family, but I have to because I care about the community and there are a lot of people that are thanking me for it. So please, just sit down, think about it, and go back and look at the allegations and address them and let's not do any more legal expense. Thank you. Any motion? I move we accept this. Approved. All second. All in favor? Just a second. I have a question yep. for Ron and a question mm -hmm. for for Mr. Basso. Sure. For Mr. Basso first. Um, are we legally required to postpone this because it wasn't part of the package? No. no. I, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Colonel Maxwell is not me. The answer is no. We've reviewed that. And secondly, this whole argument seems to be that if somebody brings a lawsuit, you're supposed to not defend against it if you, because they don't think you should. And the fact of the matter is you have an obligation I have an obligation to represent the district in the areas where we think we're correct. So, yeah, right. and then Ron, what's the effect of, of if this were delayed a month? It'd be two months. That the what was delayed? The well, if we brought it back with the with the table, is it in terms of the billing, et cetera? Are they at the end of their money? We are. We are close to the end that was appropriated and allocated and approved by the board. Um, I do believe, as uh, Mr. Basso has stated, that the um, legal requirement for us in terms of this table in or not included into this item is that the board is legally required to have the agenda posted, not necessarily the packet. Uh, the information that is contained within the item does state that the amount for uh, the request for consideration of the board to approve is the amount, and that is still the amount that's not a changed amount. Yeah, so and because, oh sorry, and because this is a not to exceed um, a professional services, it is billed by, by the hour, and it's not, um, you know, we would have to come back again if we needed to go over. So it, it is important to approve it. I think more important is the, uh, the reason for coming back for additional funding, and I think the legal team laid it out here in their writing, their, the um, adjunct to the staff memo, and that second paragraph really sums it up where it says there were unanticipated four attempts by the litigant to uh, come into court and do t what's called TROs, temporary restraining orders, that were all failed by, I think, three different judges denied. And then um, also one of them or two of them imposed sanctions for her behavior. So this kind of uh, activity is not normally anticipated, yeah. but we have to do what we think is in the best interest of our customers, our community, and right. the environment. And the long-term customers. And so and we're going to let the court decide. Yes. You know. No, I'm sorry. Your, your time is over. No. No, you are. It, we will send you out of the meeting if you don't sit down and act properly. Thank you. You know, we have differences of opinion, but that doesn't mean you can interrupt the meeting. So, moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm, I'm gonna vote for it, but I do believe the public has the right to comment on this, so I ask that in next meeting that this table be, be included in the in the packet so the public can comment at that time. Sure, we can do that. Uh, but other other board members might not agree with me. No, oh, that's fine. It's fine. Yeah. People can come and talk in open session about anything. So yep. yeah. but, 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 but this information it. it'll be in the next packet and there'll be an opportunity to comment on the Great. details. And I, did, I I agree with you Tom that this is in the best interest of the district. I mean, I just want to say that, you know, there was some questions asked about why we we're doing any of this, and it's because we have no alternative. The city has said all along they don't have enough water to serve their customers 
and our customers to make up the shortfall. So, and they've also said that if they did have enough water to give it to solve our problems, it would cost more than what we're doing here. Bottom line. Okay. So we are now um, at the time where it is oral and written communications. Um, so this is where um, anyone that wishes to address the board on items not on tonight's agenda may, may speak. Colonel Maxwell again. On the item of, gee, we have to do this. Frankly, gentlemen and ladies, the water resources here and the alternatives to pure water SoCal that would have saved this massive expenditure and not, not necessitated Ms. Steinbrenner's courageous and in the public interest efforts to stop you from failing to comply with the Environmental Quality Acts of the State of California that were intended to, and are intended to protect all of us, including future residents of this district, and certainly its children. But you neglected to do that. You neglected to comply with the law. You're trying to railroad this through. And by the way, in terms of, we do have alternatives. And the alternative is to consolidate this water district with the city of Santa Cruz and others into a regional water resources, which should have been done 25 years ago. <laughs> At an extraordinary saving and wasted duplicative unnecessary overhead that pays you all nice fees, that pays your inflated management salaries to your senior management. And by the way, you, and your senior management could all be done away with. I applaud the efforts of the workaday employees of the Water District. I want to compliment them highly. I want to compliment the late lady as well. I didn't always agree with her, but she really did her job very politely and very well. And I extend <laughs> condolence to her family. But coming back to where we are now, dealing with the realities of this Water District, and the failure for 25 years for you to consider consolidation, the failure for the state to come over and take it all over, then the, the water that Ms. Menard wants to deny sharing could be shared, by the way, and would in a regional capacity of arrangement. It would be far more efficient. It would save 70%, I calculate, of the overhead, this district, the city, and the polyglot little water districts here. So there's the solution. Consolidate, do away with you, do away with your management, and do it serve the public interest. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board on an item not on tonight's agenda? Scott, water transfers are on tonight's agenda. If you're going to be talking about that, you should wait until that item is presented. <coughs> is this for items not on the agenda? Hello, my name is Letitia Miller. I'm a customer of SoCal Creek. I'm here for myself and five other families who could not be here. We didn't know it was going to be to quarter to seven. Um, I'm just kind of appalled. I think we'd be handed the structure of this new thing you have going, this 1901. Uh, the cost of this has been astronomical. Uh, you have them the homes that have two people, five people are under the same structure. That cannot be. My water bill and the others have gone from $84 to over $250. And that has been every month. And then I understand you're going to go another 9% raise next year. This is unheard of. There are other ways to get water. My husband was superintendent of production for the Santa Cruz City Water Department for 34 years. There were other ways they could have done it also. And when he's, he's passed away, and I wish he was here, because he would tell you what the desalt plant was going to cost, and we'll tell you right now what this is going to cost. It's not only building it, but it's making it work, maintaining it. It's going to cost millions. We know that. You know that. There has to be other ways. This has got to be some kind of other structure. These families cannot afford to pay $29. You've taken away units from us on the structure. And I think there's a gentleman here that has put this out for you to realize what you've done. You've taken away units we can use, and now you've charged us more, $29.95 for each unit. That is ridiculous for a family of five. They can't afford it. Seniors can't afford it. And I think you should reconsider this. And I think the money you're paying attorneys like Central Fire had to realize you are wasting our tax dollars. 
you're wasting tax dollars. I cannot believe you're going after a person that lives in Santa Cruz County and using our customer money to fight her in court. You do have an attorney. Use him. Use him. Thank you. I just want to clarify that we're not bringing any legal action on anyone. We're just defending one. We haven't brought any legal actions. From a non-customer. Directors, I'm Ramona Andre, a rate pay payer on a fixed income in Aptos. That's right. I would like you to get water from the Santa Cruz Water District. It seems like you're being rigid about this issue and not willing to look into it. I don't like the Pure Water SoCal plan for rate increases and the recycled sewage water. This present plan causes punitive rate increases that could force us out of our property. The so-called purification that isn't may contribute to health problems. You directors bear responsibility for these decisions mm -hmm. and the future will tell and maybe sooner than the future. I, I just want to uh, say there's an item on water transfers at the end. I don't think you're listening. Okay, but yeah. It's there's, a there's an item on water transfers at the end of the meeting and you can see how much we're pursuing water transfers. And you can see how cooperative Santa Cruz is. Right. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a rate payer from Aptos. Uh, and in this last couple of months, our uh, bill went from 80 something dollars to 122. And this last bill came in at $350. Um, we were, well, we were told that there's a leak. Um, I have not been able to find a significant leak. Um, apparently the, the toilet might have been leaking a little bit, but, it, but it's not even audible. So I, I'm just wondering how, if nothing else has changed, how my bill went from 122 to $350. Uh, I, I do have three kids, so there's five of us in the house. Um, I, I can't continue to afford that. I can't be surprised by things like that just because my toilet leaks a little bit. Um, again, it's not audible. Um, I, I, did, I replaced some things. Once I saw the bill, once somebody came to the door and told us that something was leaking, but there's no significant leak. We don't have a pool. We don't, uh, so, so I just, if, if the structure of what you're doing is going to create situations like that where it's gonna affect our budget in that manner, then there's gotta be a better solution. Uh, I, I just don't know how, I mean, I certainly couldn't continue to do that month after month um, and, and within our budget. So. You do need to figure out something else uh, that that twenty nine dollars per unit when you lowered the uh, the original tier one. I, you know, I, I mean that that certainly had an effect, um, but you need to do something about this because this is not sustainable. And my in laws live right across the street from me. Uh, they were told they had a leak. Their bill went to five hundred dollars. Five hundred. Their fixed income, they can't afford that. So somebody said there was a leak, there must be. Two people have come by to check, they can't find one. So how does that happen? How is their bill suddenly $500? You have to figure this out, because that's not sustainable. So sustainable policy, please. Understood, thank you. Right. Yeah, I was going to say the there is a, a leak policy. If you if you experience a bill like that, you should contact the SoCal Water District right away to work on that. But I had I personally have had the same experience, and it was a quiet leaky toilet. And I had to finally, after fiddling with it, replacing endless parts, the toilet was no good. I replaced the toilet the very next month. I had got 
you know, praise from the water district for wise water use. You know, it really is important to, if you have an old toilet especially, to replace it. It like might need replacing. So yeah, that was that was me. It was went from thirty to three hundred at one point. You know, that and a quiet little toilet was just and running and all the time. I just also want to want to say that I'm open to any and all solutions. So if you have some ideas on how to restructure the rates next time, I'm open to that. Um, and yeah. Another program that we are doing is um, AMI, Automated Meter Infrastructure, where people on their smartphones will get alerts when a, a leak is detected. And so there won't be that lag. They'll get detected on a daily basis. On a daily basis. So you won't have to wait for a month to get it fixed. You can fix it that same day. I mean, I also wanted to mention that, you know, I'm not particularly happy with the rates either, and I'd like to see us come up with a better solution. We we had a really long discussion last time before the REITs with a citizen committee of 11 people that committed a lot of time to trying to come up with an alternative. And just, you know, the, the alternative that was chosen does drastically, you know, go from tier one to tier two. It, it goes up much higher than, than I, you know, I would like, you know, for it to happen in the, in the long run. And I think the one of the <laughs> alternatives for I, it just, it's just, if you're only two people in a house, it works okay, but if you've got a bigger family, it really makes it difficult. And so we, we did talk about water budgets as part of the rate where, you know, it would be, you'd have rates based on the number of people in the house, which would at least balance that out. So I'm open to looking at other alternatives as well. <laughs> I'm Richard Andre, an unhappy rate payer from Aptos. Uh, I'm glad to hear two of the directors say that they're open to other ideas and solutions because I think they're needed. And I don't know if you need another committee, but you've had some good ideas here tonight. I think you need to listen to them. So whether you call it lying, obfuscating, or just not having the imagination, I don't know, but it makes people angry, especially if you're taking more and more money from them. Uh, new rates with a tier of $29.19 are not even near a 9% as you advertised increase. We were told the new rate would increase our bills by 9%, or was that 5%? Uh, it's very confusing. Uh, well, uh, obfuscation, a lie. With less than 5,000 gallons used, the increase in the bill is 52%. That's a long ways from 9%. Uh, well, why this? To foot an enormous bill for a water purification project that may not be so pure. It's still sewage. Oh, it won't cause any health problems because it didn't in Orange County. Well, are we so sure? Uh, I'm not. The rate increase is not necessary if you transfer water from Santa Cruz. <laughs> We've heard you can't, that Rosemary Menard says you can't. Well, we don't believe that either. Uh, there must be a way, and there was an idea on that tonight. Consolidation. Reject the sewage in favor of rainwater from Loch Lomond and the San Lorenzo River. Try harder to arrange for that rainwater. It is better to drink and comes much cheaper. I realize there's a lot of cost to it, but much cheaper than the sewer water purification plant. So give us our preference. Rainwater with lower rates, try very hard. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make a suggestion that folks, you know, get information not just from one source, um, who you're hearing it from, um, that you do your research and and look at the studies that have been done on the quality of the water that comes out of the um, purification plants. Um, you know, just actual scientific data, okay? That's all I'm asking. And in particular, as an example of that, this consolidation notion, if we were to consolidate with some other water district and that other water district had water rights to some water, they could not share it with us. So the water right only applies to a certain area. So the city's water right can only be used in the city 
and the live oak because the water right when it was applied for applied to that area and it, you can't change it unless you go back to the state and completely redo your water right which could be done but if you if you can do Please sit down. You know, that's, that's be respectful. And which, which let's is what let's the keep city, the meeting respectful, please. Which is what the please. city is attempting to do right now. They've gone back to the state board to apply for changes, but as an example, they applied for some changes 12 years ago, and they're still waiting on those. So it doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen easily. It's possible, but, you know, we can't sit here and wait and wait and wait. We need water now. So. Okay, let's not, let's let people that come to the microphone speak, period. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I just want to say that in 2015, your board was presented legal information by uh, County Water Director John Ricker that you could apply for urgent uh, temporary water rights independent of the city, and you didn't do it. So um, what I would like to speak about is the water rates. I'm not a rate payer, you're right, but many of my neighbors are, and I care about them. And so in uh, on November 6th of 2018, your board already decided you were going to restructure the rates to support Pure Water SoCal. You didn't come out and say it blatantly because you couldn't, because legally you couldn't, because you hadn't approved the project yet. You hadn't approved the EIR, but that's what was happening. And on when you had your February 19th public hearing for your ratepayers, that's what your Raftalis consultant said. It was to support Pure Water SoCal. And you can tell that. This, this is from your uh, memo from November 6th. Scenario one includes a supplemental supply project with 45 million in funding assistance from grants and the issuance of $52 million in debt. That adds up to the Pure Water SoCal construction project amount, doesn't it? Option two includes a supplemental supply project with no grant funding and the issuance of $95 million debt. There you go. And that's what you chose to do. To increase your customers' rates, assuming no grants, to pay for Pure Water SoCal. Now you were not honest in that information when you put it out to your rate payers either about the impending rate increase. You didn't tell them what it was for. You never told them what it was for. You never showed the calculations that justified claiming rate increases were anticipated to be $5 or less per month for 70, 72 percent of the customers. That's not right. You lied to your people, <laughs> and that's quite simple. Now you come with um, uh, paperwork to some of the Water for Santa Cruz public meetings and say that your rates are on par with others, but it is quietly, quite frankly um, disingenuous because you compare your rates to trout Trout Gulch Mutual and Pure Source Water, two small, very small companies. Why don't you use the same companies that you compared your rates to in 2017 and 18 before your 17% increase back then when you were already the second highest? All of these that were in your budget package, why don't you look at those and compare yourself to those now? I've done it online and you're, you're pretty high. So I think you need to rescind your rate increases. I think you need to go back to the drawing board and talk with your rate payers and really see what they want to do because Thank you. you're really hurting them. And there are over 500 people that have signed the online protest. Thank you. Time is up. I, you know, water transfers are on the agenda. This is not about water transfer. Oh, no, this isn't about water transfer. Okay. All right. You submitted it. Uh, I, could you pass those? Oh, oh, no. Go ahead. Please pass them now. It's important. It's I'm, I'm going to just say you're using Take your, your time. presentation. Your time has started. Just uh, say what you're going to say. Information. It's production records from the Santa Cruz Water Department. I think you want to take a look at them. It's important. We can take a look, but not while you're speaking. We'll look later. Go ahead. Our policy outlines how we deal with documents that are handed out last minute. So please go. I think your Just time's going. Go ahead and up. say what you're going to say. Well, I hope you're listening. I really do. Um, 
Dr. Daniels just said there's no water in Santa Cruz. That they don't have a permit to transfer the water. This. I thought we weren't Scott, talking about, is, water about water transfers. This is about water it's transfers. It's about water transfers. Okay. It's not about water transfers. Okay. He said there is no water, there is no permit. This is a production report. Please look at me, Mr. Lahuey. I was trying, I was wanted to see if somebody put something up there related to it, okay? Well, please put it up. Well, just continue, please. Okay. This is a production report <coughs> in the city of Santa Cruz. It's a water production report. In it, the month of August, 2019, water production, North Coast Stream, 66 million gallons. Every other month has positive numbers in it. So Santa Cruz has water that it has the permission to move around. Scott, I need to stop you. I think this is about water transfers. We, we water transfer. it seems it's like you're it's talking about the point that Dr. Dr. Daniels just made that said there is no hey, water. Hey, if you feel you're being genuine, please go ahead. I am being genuine. The next page is 2018, which is last year. Last year was a very dry year. The same set of numbers is right here. You're going to look at it when you look at it. We have been arguing about this since May. Santa Cruz has water in the North Coast every month. Santa Cruz can do whatever it wants with North Coast water. Do you agree, Dr. Daniels? No, because they have fish requirements. They have other things okay, that. Now you need to listen. This is production reports. This is after the fish. Mm -hmm. One minute to go. It doesn't get into the pipes until the fish requirements have been met. This is post fish, so remember that. Santa Cruz also has 92% in Loch Lomond. Santa Cruz, if it could send water to you right now, could create an opportunity to capture stormwater. If we only have the difference between 90% and 100% in the Loch Lomond Reservoir going into the rainy season, we can only capture 300 million gallons. If we went down to 70% and sent the other 600 million to you, Santa Cruz could capture 700 million gallons. As it is now, it just goes over the spillway. So you need to think about these things. There is water. We do have ability to move. I've got 11 seconds. Kept my temper. It's been a pleasure. Well, um, we. <laughs> how that was not about water transfers, I'm still not sure. <laughs> but um, I will say that, you know, repeatedly, the director of the Santa Cruz Water Department has refuted your claims and we have to work with them. And we work with them regularly and we are transferring water, which we will talk about at a later item. Yeah, and I, I encourage everybody to stick around because Ms. Menard and her uh, chief engineers in the crowd will be part of the presentation after this. So please stick around. Hello, um, I'm Chris Kirby, uh, SoCal Creek Water Rate Payer and I keep hearing how you guys are saying that it's for the best best interest of the ratepayers. This the the prices we are paying for water right now, what happened to the five dollars or that this was gonna go charge seventy something something percent of the people? We have over five hundred people who have signed our petition online and that doesn't get out to everybody. We could start walking door to door. I have not talked to one person that's happy with this water district. Their rates are astronomical. We can't afford it. It's like a budgets. We have budgets to live on, live by, and when you compare Trout Gulch, it, that's not a fair comparison. I know somebody that's on that, uh, that works for that company. It's not a fair comparison. Neither is the second one that you list. I just feel like you guys are deceiving us right and left, and you do not care about the best interest of us. Our bill's gone up huge I, and I've been lawn shamed because I have a lawn but I tried to explain I have two big dogs I refuse to let them go to the bathroom on plastic or cement and it's good for the environment to have some lawns we were going through our neighborhood and there are a few dead ones but there's more alive lawns than not I don't understand why we're being penalized like we are for your recycled water I, I don't want to drink it I think it you guys have got to go back to the start a few of you have said that the rates are unfair you need to rescind them and go back to where we were before because it's you're going to I mean people are going to lose their homes over this and I, yeah I guess you don't care 
but we we it's just it's it's punitive and it's it's not okay I, I'm, I have other things to do with my time and be here but you people are, are not doing your jobs for us good evening my name is Gary Williamson I am a Soquel water district rate payer and I've been learning quite a bit about uh, the district over the last month. I came here as, as part of that education, uh, having no idea what I was gonna walk into, having <laughs> uh, no idea I was gonna speak, and having nothing prepared. Uh, one of the things I've, I've learned over the last month, and, and I had a sense of this, uh, was how qualified this board is, how, how amazingly qualified. And uh, uh, I, I also know personally um, that some of the people have a very caring heart, uh, have an extreme sense of community, uh, are very scientific, uh, have the ability and the want to dig into things and find solutions. Uh, from what I know about uh, uh, qual the quality program, the, someone help me, the pure water. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I know, that water is gonna be pure. Uh, I've drank the water coming out of Riverside I feel fine. I know that testing is immense and, and at a high quality, and if there was a problem, it, it would be found. I, I know that the, the, the solutions are difficult, uh, but I can't imagine that you as, as a group of people ha have not done the work you need to do and will continue to do the work necessary, uh, taking input from the group, uh, you know, uh, from all sources. And uh, I guess I, I just wanted to be a voice of thanks this evening for, for the work that you do. I don't think I'm gonna be popular with the crowd <laughs> this evening, but, uh, but that's fine. I, I love this community, I love the water, and I know that sustainability is a big job ahead, and uh, I, I support your efforts in finding solutions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I just like to observe. You know, we're we're all customers also, so we pay the same rates. We I was on the that rate committee. That group was a group of uh, any citizen who wanted to belong to that committee. They were able to participate, and we worked for. 18 months, more than 18 months really in the end, and they all came, limited, some were from limited income, some were very wealthy, and they just had so many properties, they were tired of paying what they thought was a high water bill. They all came to this agreement that, you know, finding a solution, and we struggled with these rates, but this is, this is our best approach, that it really is expensive, I think uh, once the road is clear that the project can go through, the state can help us with our grants, this 9% increase is going to be reconsidered. It won't be necessarily part of our future rates. So I just want to uh, stay calm and keep going and keep an open mind. Don't trust all that you read on the internet. Consult a number of different sources on this. Um, we're all working really hard to get this district sustainable. Anyone else? You already spoke. <laughs> nope. Oral communication. Still, <laughs> open. It seems like it, but no. <laughs> I have some information and some calculations I did myself that I'd like to share. I understand your policy. Oh, I do, it's fine. But I'm gonna refer to some very specific things and I apologize that you don't have it in front of you. It's okay. Just my name is Mark Kirby. I am a ratepayer here in the district. Uh, I've, I, I'm the kind of person who 
doesn't believe everything I see, doesn't believe what I read on the internet. But I have heard about, uh, you know, the advertisement that the average person's bill would go up $5, that the last rate increase was 9%. And I saw my bill go up considerably more than that. So I wanted to sit down, do a little, little work on that, figure it out myself. Pulled out my April bill, pulled out my June bill. You know, I started looking at it and became very obvious very quickly that the amount of an increase that someone would, would be paying was based very much upon how much water they would be using. I put together a tiered calculation where I calculated under the old rates and under the new rates what the increase would be comparing like usage prior and after. So let me just hit some, some key points because I, I do have a question here I want to get to. Um, under the old system, our, our monthly connection fee was $32.95, right off my own bill. The new one is $37.04. It's a $4.09 increase. It's 12.43%. Tier 1, which used to be 7.99 HCF, went down to 5.99. The rate went from 690 down to 643 47 cent decrease. Uh, it's a 6.81% decrease. Thank you for that. We're going the right direction. Uh, those two HCF, though, that now went from tier one to tier two, went from $6.90 to $29.19. They went up $22.29 or 323%. Tier two went from, from $9.11 to $29.19. 220% increase. I'm not seeing 9% here, uh, you know, so I started doing a little more math. And I calculated at 6.99 HCF, what would, my, what would my bill be? At 7, what would it be? Old method, new method. So at 6, my bill would have gone from $81 to 104, a 29% increase. At 7 HCF, my bill would have gone from $88 to $133, 52% increase. At 8 HCF, my bill would have gone from $97 to $163, a 67% increase. The next, the next one, 9 HCF, was an 80.93% increase. The next one was 91, the next one's 101 and 109. It continually progresses. I'm not seeing 9% here. For, for any of these rates. Um, I'm wondering if perhaps there was uh, a calculation done to derive the $5. I'd like to see Thank it you. perhaps. I'm sure that you could get that because there is, I mean, it's based on an average of all of the customers, not just one customer's bill. So we, you know, so, but I'm sure that we can get you those numbers. It sounds like, it sounds like you're very good with numbers. And so what's happened is there's a lot of people using a lot less water than the, Right, four HCF mm -hmm. or or five HCF. A lot of people are in tier one, so that's that's where what oh. balances it. Let's let and, it sit. And there the nine the nine percent is based not on an individual. It's, too, so. it's not not based on an individual. It's based on the entire income for the district. It, let's let the customer sit down. That would be better. Yeah, that's that's we're done now. Yeah, thank you. Under transparency, I would just ask you to share that. Yeah, that's fine. Well, yeah, I think that's absolutely. Good, thank you very much. We. we we, uh, you know, we, I think the board received, uh, okay, you got another person. Hi, my name is Mary Saxon, I live in Capitola. I'm here on behalf of my neighbors um, whose rates just went way up. Mine was $80 a month to 330. Same thing, the woman across the street, 125 to $500. An elderly woman down the street, I, what, hers, 125 to 350. Two people living in these homes not a big family. We just would like you to consider an alternative to what's going on because it's, it's hardship. And these tier one people are a lot of vacation people who just come here for the weekends and they're, they're not living here full time and feeling the impact of this hardship. So you, you people are smart, come on. You've gotta come up with something else. Even if it means we go to California, we go and we lobby to get these rights changed. It, you, you know, it, that's what it's going to take. And we're here, and there's a lot more people Understood. that are willing to partake to help you get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, All right. Is this still submitted? All right. Is it 
My name's Marie Thompson. I'm a Soco Creek uh, water uh, user, and my daughter and I uh, are uh, living in, in a uh, single family home. I don't water my front yard. If you drive by Beregas Drive, you'll see it's dead. I feel I'm being penalized for using less water. It's, it, that's what it came down to. You said it yourself. We're all using less water. Kudos to us. But our bill has gone up and up and up. So I'm here to protest that. Please do something about it. I'm retired. I have a fixed income. And I can't handle this. Thank you, Mary. Understood. Thank you. So, um, and it, it, it coincided with the change of the meter. So we tried to resolve it. They said the calibration's okay. We asked for daily logs. They said you can't get daily logs from those dates. Um, so we're just, you know, I don't know how we can sustain something. And we are using less water. We're not watering our garden and just trying to survive. And everything seems to be so expensive now. We don't want to leave the county. We just can't afford it. Okay. Thank you. We do have the we do we do have the service of really talented um, staff to come out and help figure out how to reduce water use for people that do that for as a free service. So um, if you can't figure out why the water use is as high as it is, they can at least try and help you figure that out. Um, yes, and I, go ahead. I'll add that uh, the board received uh, five six letters from members of the public expressing concerns. Okay. like you hear like this and so we we sent out letters today acknowledging uh their input and and try to honor that not just by sending a single response to one person although we did try to individualize them to some degree to to really you know make that connection but more importantly honor their comments by creating an faq because what are the some of the questions you're hearing tonight are the same you know that were repeated so everybody can have the um benefit of uh, our response to that person. Other people may have similar questions. So I encourage um, people who have questions to go through this, and it's attached to each of the people. But it talks about the cost. Um, may not be what you want to see, but this is you know our best effort to get responses to the questions we're hearing. So you know I think the one tonight that I'll just accent is the uh, tier one, tier two rates. Um, that is the level, it's one penny a gallon when it's in tier one and four pennies a gallon when it's in tier two. That's what you pay for the price and it does add up if you use a lot of water. The reason for that break is that's what the consultant uh, and the consultants determined as the sustainable limit per household. So we didn't discriminate whether you have a lawn or whether you have a lot of people it was just per household. So, and, and it is a bright line. We acknowledge that. Regarding the rates, just to put it in perspective, I heard it's not fair to compare to one eight small agency. I think these are the smaller ones. Here's SoCal, Santa Cruz rates inside the, for the average customer bill of six units is this, outside the district, it's this. So I wanna be very clear on that. We're right with our neighbors in that billing there. And anyway, the, the questions are, are out there. They're posted on our website and sent individually to each person who had that. So again, to try to provide some meaningful um, response to some of these questions, uh, it may not bring down your, your cost. Although as mentioned, we do have many programs to do that. The free water wise house call is probably our foremost flagship and it's it's helped a lot of people not everybody i know some of you in the crowd here tonight have used that service for whether it's leak detection uh putting on low flow shower heads or whatever but we do make an attempt to, especially those people that are going up into the second tier to um lower the cost we know it's tough there's two nice questions Wait. excuse me excuse me okay um i, I think we're done with Public comment, so we're closing that. Um, yeah. Board? I, um, as you recall, I didn't like the rates. And the one thing I didn't like was the big jump and how small amount it jumped at. And I would love for us to 
And we, yeah, and for me, I didn't have any knowledge of how you got to that point. You know, it just came to me. And so I did actually vote against it. Um, but it was mostly because of that jump, and that's what these people are, are upset about. And even I had a leak, and I got the $250 bill three months in a row before I figured it out, so I understand that. I'm just wondering um, when we could, br when are we bringing the rates back so we can look at how it was set up, because it was a big jump, and yeah, I mean, and overall and we need the money to do what we're gonna do, but how we did it seemed well, I, I've I've heard what people have said, and we have the 218 process, and it's good for three years. It gives a maximum amount. Doesn't mean we have to charge the maximum. Right. Um, but the reason we went to two tiers was plain and simple that we had more tiers, and we were challenged on that in court, and the challenge was. Uh, upheld and so we uh, basically became gun shy is what I think happened so you know I, I'm I'm a, I'm at it I think we have to I'd like to see how many people are being affected how much the rates are going up um, and and then have the discussion on whether we we yeah. open up uh, the, the rates and, the and nothing prevents us from doing that you know okay, just yeah we could do that we don't but have I think to we still have to go with two tiers we still well, you, you have to I abide to by the prop yeah. proposition 218 which requires that your tiers and Bob you can help me out are your your cost is as that nexus to the customer Understood. basically one customer is not subsidizing another customer and rationale for why it's um, it is, and well a strong I rationale. I understand that. I don't know if the other directors want to see it, but I want to see how many people are being affected. Yeah, I'd We've like heard to see from that. A, sure. a lot of people here. Right. Um, and I believe we base the, the top of the first tier on what it would take to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. But um, there's, there's many ways to look at that. I mean, it doesn't have to be six, right? It could be. Well, let me put another thing, and it's in the FAQs. It, it, it well, <laughs> that's a that's a bigger I've, topic. I, but I've done rates before, so. But it, <laughs> the, um, the nine percent, six percent of that nine has nothing to do with a supplemental supply option. This is in the FAQ. Mm -hmm. So six out of those nine, six percent out of the nine, are just the cost. It has nothing to do. It has cost escalation, our infrastructure, the 3% is in pursuant of s additional water supplies such as water transfers, pure water SoCal, uh, recharge and that sort of thing. So even if you stripped away and we said no supply, which would mean severe cutbacks for water use and higher costs because we have fixed cost, that's, the, that's what the analysis done by UCSC is. And this is, I think, in the FAQ. So it is a complex thing. It's not easy on anybody, there, there's, there's probably a few ways to go. Uh, water budgets, mm -hmm. uh, the two tier, maybe a flat rate, but then the lower users become more um, but it, it could be distributed <laughs> in many ways. I think people understand a certain percentage increase to cover costs. I think the hardest part is this, the tiers, yeah. the, the dramatic change because right. I because I think that's the part that's bothered me the most is yep. if you're a two-person family and you keep it under you know 50 gallons per person per day then you're okay but if you have more people that you may not have control over um, you know then then that's where it becomes unfair so well, um, there, there are choices even with more people well, let's let's there not are. spend discussing yeah, 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 exactly. right. but let's, let's bring well, it back and discuss right. it and people can come back to that sure let's let's yeah, yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. but okay. one thing we need to all be aware of is that because we lost that lawsuit, we can't go back to the rates we had before. You know, the four right. tier water right. no. rates we had before, we can't do that. Right. So we have to be creative and come up with something that is still going to be a change, but it, it hopefully can be fair if we come up with something different. Yeah. Well, that's it'll be different. Well, I'd like, I'd, before we have that discussion, I'd like more information on, on how the rates are. Mm -hmm. 
are affecting people. I mean, it'd be very simple to do a cumulative, to do a plot that has, How many like, people are staying like Mr. Mr. Kirby said, you know, do our own plot on that and see how many people are involved in each of those water uses areas and, they, you know, just get, get all the facts and then see. I think that's a good first step. It's okay. just to say how, you know, we've heard from people, we, we know we were uncomfortable with that jump in tier, but how is it actually playing out? Granted, they did a, you know, a model for how many people would be affected. But I think I think coming back with let's yeah, see how now, how it, now that was a model. Let's see what the reality. What's is. the reality? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the, the bottom line is there's a fixed there's a certain cost unless we get grants and you know low interest loans. There's a specific for cost for supplemental water supply for that part. But there's also the cost just for O and M and taking care of the system now the operations and maintenance of the Don't system. Right. So, but I, I, I totally get if people think that we don't need a supplemental water supply and their rates are going up and they, they think that's because of the supplemental water sure. supply that they're pissed off. We can always do a better job of, of outreach. But if you say sure. six of the nine percent is not even, yeah. it's just from regular stuff. So, okay, well, let's move on. Um, we've had thank, you, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, thank you for coming. You You're welcome to stay. To if your time. You don't yeah, have please to. Please stay. If you don't You've been heard. I think um, I, can, I can. For the river. The next item's great item to stay for too. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we've got some. Reports. We have a management update first. Uh, item 5.1. Or are we going to move it up? To we we could move, move the river one up if if you sure. thought sure. that yeah, would I think it's leave the. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Let's go to item uh, six point three. Where are we? Three. Six three. Six three. three. Got it. Never like that. The jump. The jump. Yeah. No, but we were. We voted for it. That no, was but we. We tried to figure out another alternative. But I think maybe in retro in retrospect, maybe we could have had a higher first year. There's nothing I don't perfect. Know. We can't. Okay. I've known them. I understand. Okay, those guys well, that move. No, a higher first year. Because the, thre the threshold. Yeah. I don't think next year. We Everybody. It's just where you pay. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> All right, so now we are going to start with item 6.3. Um, who is introducing this item? I will. Tosh? Mm. If the audience could please cut the noise down. It would be good for you to stay. We're on our next item. Thank you. Yeah, I do hope most of the audience stays to hear this because it is relevant. <laughs> um, Tonight, um, as you see next to me, we have Rosemary Menard, the water director for City Water de uh, Department, and Heidi Luckenbach. She's the engineering manager, de chief deputy director. And then Christine Mead also is with me. Uh, at the podium, we have Emily Tummins with Black and & Veatch, and she's been with us over the course of the water quality studies. And um, we're gonna tag team this and do a little intro, go, go dive deep into some of the water quality parameters that we have measured over the course of the last year, and then kind of circle back going to look forward. Thank you for, for staying Sticking through around. a longer <laughs> public comment than we anticipated. We're from the city of Santa Cruz, we're used to that. <laughs> yeah, from time to time. From time to time. Yeah. Okay, so our, our effort for looking for a supplemental supply began a um, long time ago, as our, our board knows and some of our customers knows. We went through a long process, a 14-month effort um, to consider options. But before looking at water supplies, we, we want to maximize our conservation and make sure our customers use as little as possible. We also have a significant effort for groundwater management and that is kind of supported by the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and the Mid-County Groundwater Agency. Um, and then we, of course, we've heard tonight some 
talk about Pure Water Soquel and recycled water and our efforts to uh, prevent seawater intrusion through um, recharge wells. Uh, what's bolded here in red is the river water transfer and purchase from the city of Santa Cruz. And so we will focus on that tonight. Of course, we do have desalination and stormwater capture uh, in our portfolio that we're following. Because we wanted uh, our customers to know how important this is, and um, I don't see, Mr. there's Mr. McGilvery, um, district's guiding principles for river water purchase and transfer. We've, we've incorporated this into our guiding principles so that we can look back to it and make sure we're following along. Um, this led us to a pilot agreement that'll be the next slide and a, a five-year short-term pilot project to investigate and resolve potential issues when bringing surface water into a predominantly groundwater uh, distribution system. Um, also listed here in the second bullet, amend the district's domestic water supply permit to add the city's surface water as a supply source. Um, of course, we wanted to be ready to receive water on November 1st, which is when the, n the winter period kind of begins, November 1st through April 30th. Um, and then also moving forward with the city to better understand benefits, issues, constraints of the city long, uh, long term uh, water rights with the San Lorenzo River. This is just a clip of the purchase agreement that is, is, has been executed and we've been running last winter. We use this. Um, I, what's highlighted here are some points that we want to make sure people understand that this is just the beginning of an effort, a long-term effort and we recognize that we need to start somewhere, and so here we are with a pilot project. Um, we've been asked by some members of the public to just open the valve and do it. Um, certainly there are legal constraints, and there's also technical constraints that we wanna make sure we don't make missteps. Um, that has been done in some communities, and we don't wanna be on the front page with problems. What this short-term pilot project is um, getting its source water from is the north coast, the city's north coast streams, and they're um, primarily Majors Creek and uh, Lydell. Um, there is another Laguna Creek, but I believe the fish uh, requirements up there are, are pretty high, so they, they can't take too much water from that. I think just because, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Heidi and Rosemary, just because there are no water rights constraints up there, it does not mean that you're exempt from any fisheries, resources, uh, or protected species. So, so through the past three to four years, we've been working on several studies. Um, Black and Veatch did conduct a desktop analysis, which led us uh, in the meantime, the city was working on a CEQA document um, which is governing the current pilot study. Um, and then we also did some jar testing and bench scale testing between September and June of 2018, September 20, 2016 to June 2018, which led us to last winter when we did um, provide city surface water to approximately 2,300 connections, um, and we brought in 165 acre feet. Um, through uh, the month prior to that, we were sampling our distribution system that you can see in, in red, and it's generally around Soquel Creek. Th all throughout the transfer, and then three months after that, we collected distribution samples to understand what happens to the distribution system when a different water is introduced. When I say a different water, I hope everyone in the audience and watching understands that up until then, all of the water going through our pipes was from groundwater wells. Um, the city has water that is from a, a flowing source, and so there's different water quality chemistry and Emily will, will go through that. 
to the right of this slide, we are anticipating starting the second year of um, pilot water purchase, and it's an expanded zone. The highlighted area is the area that we notified our customers of. We don't anticipate <coughs> the water comes from the west, so 41st Avenue is where our intertie connection is, and it will make its way to the east. Um, generally speaking, we don't think that the water will make it past that red line, which we call the, the border between subarea one and two. I am gonna pass it off to Emily, and she's gonna go through some of the parameters that we uh, analyzed over the course of the last transfer. Thank you, Taj. Um, yeah, so Taj create, uh, laid out a great background. Um, I will provide just a tidbit more of a refresher and then dive into the water quality results, which is what um, my part of the presentation focuses on and then into the next steps. So the background, um, as Taj mentioned, there's been multiple steps um, that we've been involved in. And uh, most recently I was out here talking about the bench scale testing results that were successful and led us in to the pilot um, that showed that pipe loop testing was not necessary prior to, to beginning our, our first transfer of water. And I want to clarify that the team working on this report comprised of a very qualified um, individual, Mark Edwards, who is from Virginia Tech University, and he was the one um, primarily investigating the Flint, Michigan issue. So please understand that this was a, a very technically um, savvy team, and, and we moved forward because of this. As Taj mentioned as well, we developed a, an, an extensive monitoring plan. We wanted to make sure that prior to the transfer, we created baseline data, and I have a couple of graphs on the next slide. So there's um, the pre-transfer, then there's, uh, that began in October of 2018. The transfer itself, uh, allowing cities water to enter the district's pilot area, um, began in uh, December of 2018 and then that lasted through the end of April and then the post transfer data we wanted to make sure that the water quality still um, stayed at a very high level after going back to just being served by the groundwater wells. Um, throughout the area in the map you see the small pilot area that was used and the um, the inner tie is pointed out as, as well as the three sample sites are in blue circles um, where distribution system water quality was analyzed for a large slew of parameters. <clears throat> this graph shows the water uh, volumes that was transferred throughout um, throughout the transfer um, as well as when supplemental water was necessary to be provided from the district's wells. Um, the availability of water is another issue in addition to water quality. And so there were times where the blue line rep represents the water um, that was received from the city or imported and the green and the pink lines represent two of the district's wells that served this area during, um, during the transfer. So there were some times where supplemental water was um, necessary. And then uh, in total we had about 165 acre feet brought over from the city's sources. Was that by design to try different wells to see what the effect was? Because it looks like there's just two. Main Street was in the later period used more. I, I think that um, there were some operational things that happened in that segment um, after we began in uh, December. Then there was a change in the structure in part because you guys needed to operate your O'Neill Street well. I see. Uh, so there were some things that were going on that were, uh, you know, sort of necessary for maintaining the ability to access wells in the event that um, we weren't able to supply um, you know, water, I think that that segment in um, 
in February, March, we had a very dry period there. We weren't actually bringing very much water in from the coast at that time. Um, so well, no, there's another factor as well. We've been doing some work on our O'Neill well because I remember of that, right. yeah. and, and we wanted to try it out and see did those fixes work. Mm -hmm. right. So we wanted to try it out for that first green period. Right. And then after that, we decided, well, we don't, don't want to do that. So we turned the Main Street well on the, the second time we had right. an issue. So, th so there were a variety of things. And I think that, uh, you know, we were all sort of learning what kinds of factors needed to be taken into account when, you know, we're trying to operate. So. Yeah, if we look at the period from March through April, that's sort of the, you know, Hopefully we can do that this coming winter. Um, we do note that the, cap the demand in subarea one is, is larger than what is likely available. So, you know, if we do this again next year, you'll see a, a graph that will have wells coming on um, to, to make up the demand. Mm -hmm. But at no time will it pin like it did it's with one well handling all the demand. Not likely. No. Wasn't, wasn't there a time when the city couldn't provide water because of some fish requirements on the north coast? Yeah. Reduced. Um, I think that was actually, we did we were meeting our fish requirements, which we always do first, but um, what we needed to be able to do is to produce about a million gallons a day um, so that over the month, uh, if we're going to send a million gallons to or however much the volume is, we need to be able to balance the books at the end of each month saying that we produce this much water from the North Coast sources and we sent it. It's obviously not molecule for molecule, right? right. But it, it has to, the books have to balance. Okay. Um, that's one of the parameters that we report to the state about. So one of the water quality parameters that does vary between um, the district source and the city sources are uh, the TOC, the total organics um, carbon in the water. Again, it's the difference between groundwater and surface water typically. Um, and so here we see that there's a, before the transfer when we were doing the, the monitoring, the TOC levels were lower. Um, the TOC did increase with during the transfer with the city's water being used, but both, it's important to remember that both sources are very high quality water sources, but this is a, a difference in water quality and one that, that we wanted to um, evaluate. And yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, and so with higher TOC levels, it's important to look at that effect on disinfection byproducts so there were a, a number of samples collected throughout um, at the three sample stations out in the distribution system as well as at the inner tie. And um, what we did was the, the maximum contaminant level, the regulatory level for these constituents are based on a locational running annual average. So in order to do that, we took a worst case look, trying to be as conservative as possible and took the highest value from these different quarters. So you can see the quarters highlighted at the top. And even with doing that, with the highest values collected during all of those, um, the results at the three sample stations were about half of what the, um, the MCL is for total trihalomethanes. Um, and again, this is just in result to the seasonal seasonality of this water transfer. And on the next slide, it's the same sort of graphic for the haloacetic acids, the five that are used in the regulation. Again, it did increase when the city's water was being used um, just due to slightly longer water age. Um, but again, we looked at the very worst case values and it still was typically about um, half of the, the MCL, the regulatory levels. So both high quality waters prior to um, the study and it was still within regulatory um, standards. We also looked at the effect on corrosion, um, specifically metals like lead and copper and all the values that were collected throughout the transfer um, and after the transfer 
were below the action levels. Um, all of the lead levels, except for one, were even below detection limits. So very good results um, throughout this study. The sites that were located within um, this pilot area of the distribution system haven't been sampled um, as lead and copper rule sample sites for about 10 years. So we didn't have historic or recent historic data to compare to, but again, everything was below um, action levels for lead and copper. Uh, like I said, we tested for uh, a number of different analytes and here's a giant list of all sorts of inorganics that were tested throughout the system and all of those were non-detect, uh, non below detection limits um, based on what the, uh, the state sets for reporting limits. Um, average turbidity was very low. These are things that a customer could notice, the aesthetics. Um, there were only three customer complaints throughout this entire pilot system, and all were uh, very easily resolved with some simple flushing. The thought is that it might be due to the reversal of flow in the areas. Um, there were uh, only one location had a small spike in heterotrophic plate counts, but it was very short-lived, um, so it could have just been as simple as um, uh, some slight contamination on the sample port. Uh, but again, we will continue to sample for that if another pilot project continues for more transferred water, um, just to ensure that that is indeed the case. And then pH is so important and we didn't see any um, significant changes in pH throughout the transfer. Um, there's been a slight decrease lately, so it's just something to keep our eyes on, but that's been back with the district wells. So I had a question about you. So you're taking your samples just a point in time for copper and lead because it's... All of those are grab samples. Yeah. Yes. So have, is that something that varies much over time? You know, how representative is that point in time? Yeah, so copper and lead along with the other slew of metals were measured at the distribution system sample sites, those three sites as well as the inner tie. Um, I think it was every other week throughout the transfer uh, sampling period. And then- um, Excuse me, the, it was weekly. Weekly, okay. Um, and then um, the tap samples that were collected at select customer houses were also sampled for lead and copper. Um, and that was a sample was taken during the transfer and a sample taken after the transfer. So those were pointing just three samples from there and, and then weekly from in the distribution system? Yes. Much variance in the distribution system data? Or nothing of? Um, no, we didn't really see. It was all below yeah. reporting detection limits. Yeah. So the m major conclusion is that the water quality uh, transfer, it, w it was a success based on the water quality results um, as showed. Um, it stayed within regulatory um, parameters for DBPs. It was non-detect for lead and copper um, in the distribution system. Um, the tap samples for lead and copper were below the action levels. Um, so overall, the water quality transfer um, was a success in terms of the quality of water that was provided. So there are some next steps um, if we are to look at the second phase of, of this pilot water transfer project. There's a um, red outline highlighted for what the phase two area could look like that Taj mentioned at the beginning. This uh, red area is service area one. It is unlikely that the water would exceed past um, further to the east um, based on the demands in this area and the potentially available water from the city. And again, um, monitoring would be key. Uh, again, doing the pre-transfer uh, water to again create a baseline for this larger area that could be receiving water during the transfer and then post. Um, but a number of the analytes we would not recommend uh, retesting as they were below detection limits throughout the entire um, length of the study. And so as a cost saving measure, 
um, some of those analytes could be removed. And then it's important to discuss sample site uh, selection with DDW to get their input. I have a question. It, it seems that all of the tests were done in the open distribution system. Like for example, none of the tests were in uh, tanks. And I know in the past, all of our problems about dis dis disinfection byproducts has been in the tanks because you get the chlorine and other stuff up in there and it just sits and sits. And if you don't test for those, we're not sure how much gets up there and it probably has a very long decay life uh, once it gets up there. I don't know. And I think testing the in, in the tanks to see how much gets there and how long it stays and what kind of disinfection byproducts we have get engendered in those tanks would be a key thing to do. So I would like to see that for phase two. Okay. We do have uh, maybe even longer residence time with sample sites that are at the end of a really long line that is served by a tank. And so we've identified some of those in the second phase um, that we will, we've identified to monitor for those specifically. Um, we can discuss adding the tanks themselves if we wish, um, if that would make you feel more comfortable to look at that plus the distribution system. Usually the state requires it being in the distribution system, not sure. at the tank. Sure. But if to the extent these tanks are feeding the distribution system, I mean, that's always been our worst problem. And I would like to see what is the worst problem with this transfer too, to make sure that everything is totally, absolutely hunky-dory and not just hunky-dory some places. So I think the one thing that I would like to just suggest maybe be considered, um, typically in a surface water system where these kinds of things are issues, distribution system management, water age management is a pretty active uh, activity. So people uh, look at different ways of operating their tanks to turn them over more rapidly. They uh, change the way that um, the system functions. We certainly have done that in the Santa Cruz system over the last, you know, 20 years between when the, the stage two DBP regs came in. I mean, we, we may have to do what you are doing. We haven't had to do that right. because it didn't get up to a dangerous stage. Right. But that was our worst problem area. Yeah, I mean, I guess the one thing I would say from having participated in the development of the disinfection byproducts and the surface water treatment rules that we're currently living on uh, or under, that, um, you know, this, the, the sort of psychology of what we're trying to do is think about water as a perishable product that needs to be managed really from the source to the tap. So water aging is a really big issue that I think a lot of surface water utilities over the last couple of decades have really been working on understanding what's going on in their system and how they're operating and change, taking active measures to change their operation to really maintain a, a reasonable water age uh, in their system. So I'd just like to see where we stand right now with this program. I agree we can do things to make it better if there is a problem, but let's see if there is a problem at all. You know, to that point, when we did do our model, computer modeling, we did analyze what it would take to decrease the water age by cycling the tanks more. Um, that is a balancing act with being prepared during a natural disaster, during a large fire. You know, these, these public safety shutoffs did give us some notice. So I wouldn't say that we would be vulnerable to those because we can top off the tanks in those instances. But for the, for the unpl unplanned natural disaster, if you're caught um, down at the bottom of a cycle or a main break, um, you could dewater the system, which is not desirable at all. So it's, I think for us, we would like to see worst case scenario and keep um, our operation as it is for this next winter. Definitely. That would generate probably the worst case results. It always depends on what source the city's using at the time. As we've seen, it does vary. Um, so yeah, we will, we have that in, in our, our recipe book, um, but I think we do want to understand what is the bookend of both, both options. But I think we can add the tanks. Um, Christine and I will discuss that and see if we can do that. Thank you. Questions? Yep. Do you have any? No. So page 116 of your report 
talks about HAA5, which is, give me, give me the acid, halo... Haloacetic acid. Haloacetic yeah. acids. So first question, there's an MCL for them. So how nasty are they? What, what, I just don't have a history. I don't have knowledge of... Disinfection byproducts. byproducts are, as a, as a rule, they are chronic exposure contaminants. The uh, concerns are typically some kind of a cancer endpoint. And the, the MCLs were set based on a two liter per day consumption of water over the, those MCL limits for 70 years. And that's how the analysis was done and how they were set. So it's not a, it's chronic. Not acute. Yeah, versus acute. So that, so when you go to the chart below on that, it shows that, um, thank you for blowing it up. It shows that the maximum levels during a quarter for Cherryville Avenue, <coughs> 79 is above the MCL. Um, so does that require us to do anything? Should so we be doing something? So again, the MCL is based on the locational running annual average. Okay. So it's not just based on one point. So typically you would uh, like monitor for every third week in a quarter <coughs> and you would take that sample. Yep, for yep. this analysis, we took the worst value in that yep. quarter. So it's conservative. And yes. So for you, for you to see, exceed the MCL, for us to exceed the MCL, we'd have to have that maximum value for three quarters of the year. Yeah, which and, didn't I, happen. and I guess I will tell you that typically the haloacetic acid levels are higher in the uh, wintertime in our water. We typically see that. And the THMs are typically higher in the um, summertime when the warmer water and the, the chemistry kinetics will tend to be more actively forming the um, the THMs, total yeah. trihalomethanes. Okay, and the HAAs are? They typically we'll see that. Have, does it have to do with organics? They all have to do with organics. Okay, they're, okay. they're a combination of total organic carbon and, and typically chlorine. Yes. So they're all form uh, one kind of a um, characteristic of, or, you know, a set of compounds that are related and typically uh, the trihalomethanes are chlor chlorinated, brominated, some kind of a combination of, you know, dibromochloromethane, dichlorobromomethane, those kinds of things. All right. I have one more, but Go if ahead. you want to talk on this. Well, I want to mention something more. relative to that. Okay, uh, we were yeah. talking about the uh, two liters a day for 70 years. That's definitely used for producing the public health goals, but often it's not used for the uh, MCLs. No, and no, that's not correct, actually. These a those were actually the way that the exposure was um, developed was two liters a day of um, water above these standards for 70 years. The MCL goal, if it's a carcinogen, is zero. The MCLG is always, by law, is mm -hmm. set at zero. Yeah. But I know some constituents, like arsenic, is a thousand times higher than the public health goal. So yes. um, there, are, there are exceptions. Well, I, you know, again, it's set on a uh, health risk analysis with a particular uh, sense of what the exposure is and, and then what the, whether, what the endpoint is you're managing for also. But, the, but the, the, pup, the MCL also uses how difficult is it to get it down there, its cost, there, and yes, et cetera. There are other considerations added to the mix. Th so. There is that. And then my other question was on page 117. There's a table with the complaints. There are three complaints that are in that table. So is that all the complaints that occurred? And it looks like they responded to quickly and solved, but things like you know, cloudy water and particles or brownish water, are they, how do you, why do you think these things occurred? Um, those were the only three complaints that we received that we um, in that area during that time, which um, other than like chlorine odor and whatnot. So um, we think that it was because it was easily um, uh, resolved by flushing that it was more due to a change in direction because of the isolated zone. Um, water was 
coming down one direction from the inner tie um, when typically when that zone wasn't isolated, it could have been uh, mostly going the opposite way. So. Okay. So for the second phase, there's going to be additional flushing or? Yes. Well, we won't have um, the change in direction issue for this next phase. Because that's only in the first segment that with it near the water transfer. Right, and that was because we had valves closed to isolate that portion of the distribution system, so it forced the water to go a different direction than normal. Okay. Anybody else? Who's next? I'm going to continue. Okay. Um, one thing to note, I know we've really talked a lot about disinfection byproducts, but what is being presented by Emily and what's in the packet is for that isolated zone. Now we know through modeling and through our own data that our water does get older as it goes further into sub area one. So we will watch that and, and we'll continue to report that um, as it comes available. So beyond water quality, we also want to just touch on some of the other things that we learned and that we have to be aware of. Um, this list of bullets is not comprehensive. There were other items that we did leave off just to spare you, but uh, the dialogue has been, um, you know, going back and forth with the city to talk about anything that we need to do this coming winter to um, overcome some of those challenges. But you know, high on the list is water supply reliability. Now, at this time, we've we've mentioned we have to keep our wells uh, ready and available in case. Um, the city has asked us to cut back or if the valve needs to be turned down, we got to make up the difference. And so our wells need to stay um, ready for that. Um, so reliability, quantity, um, cost is something that we want to touch on tonight. Um, the hydraulics, and I want to touch on the pipes and how they worked. Um, and some of these other things we won't dive too deep into. This, I'm, I'm going to let Heidi and Rosemary um, stop me if I'm getting this wrong, but this slide is from a meeting of theirs that they had with the Water Commission in, on April 1st of this year. And it, it has been stated earlier tonight that this is sort of the priority for their water um, use, and it, it goes to make sure that their fish flow requirements are met. We don't ignore those. We don't look past those. That's priority one uh, for them. Uh, then after that, they meet the demands of their customers. And then after that, they put water in storage, whether it's Loch Lomond or maybe through ASR. And then after that, they consider what's available as surplus or excess, okay? This is a very complicated table, and I don't want anybody to get too focused on it, but this um, is just an example that we are trying to look at the full spectrum here. While this pilot project is limited in, in availability and it's about 300 acre feet, we're optimistic both agencies are working to try to maximize whatever is available. This table is intended to provide at least a, a rough estimate of the availability of differing amounts. We've got 1,500 acre feet, 500 acre feet, 300 acre feet under different scenarios where we have the existing groundwater um, Graham Hill treatment plant and then any improvements to the right. There are various historical um, climate change um, flow requirements for the fish on the far left and then different demands that the city is expecting. There's a couple things that, you know, were made clear that night, and I'm going to just, I have it in quotes, and I think Rosemary has mentioned it before. Um, I think our board has, has heard that, and we've accepted it, um, that the city can provide some water, but not the full amount that we're looking for. We want to be thankful for what we may have available, and so we're going to maximize that and move forward that way. Um, of course, the 1,500 acre feet is what we're looking to reliably obtain to restore the groundwater basin. Are there any questions on this from the board? 
You've, you may have seen this before. And that's just water transferred to us and not water transferred back to them. And it's just <coughs> how much could they give us and literally give us, right? I believe so. Yes, this is a, um, these were assumed that they were kind of one way. But the other thing I guess I just want to um, note here is our analysis is probabilistic. We don't use a single year. We don't, you know, look at the data. We, we look at 70, 80 years of data under a variety of either historic or the climate change scenarios that have been developed. So the, uh, this data basically says that for uh, the 1,500 acre feet, the way this was done was um, it was kind of the capacity of the inner tie opened up all the time in a consecutive system strategy, meaning that part of your service area would get our water year round. So it would be, you'd buy that water wholesale from us. And it was done that way really to, um, to help sort of minimize the cost of additional infrastructure and in delivering it to you guys, um, in particularly in light of the fact that we're in involved in making substantial investment in our the backbone infrastructure of our water system and so not having to have anybody have to absorb addi additional costs associated with additional infrastructure was a was a strategy um, and you can see that under either one of the scenarios it's really we don't have the water looking at the whole record that's been created under historical and the other climate change alternatives even under the low demand scenario, which is the what we've been experiencing basically 2016, 17, 18, and now 19, um, we do not have reliability to provide the, hundred, the 1,500 acre feet that you're looking for. Uh, under the 300 acre feet or the 500 acre feet, we have substantial reliability under most of the scenarios. Uh, we don't have that under the high, um, demand, the 3.2 billion gallon demand uh, under the climate catalog, because as we've talked about in other settings, uh, that one has its rainfall all condensed into a one or, you know, a relatively condensed period of time, which doesn't really support a very good water transfer pro uh, or aquifer storage and recovery strategy. Would you like to move on? Okay, um, the current source up, up Highway 1, the North Coast streams, is conveyed down to the city's Graham Hill treatment plant through a, lo a long pipeline, and we call it the North, or they call it the North Coast Pipeline, and it gets boosted up to the Graham Hill treatment plant through the Coast Pump Station, which can be vulnerable to flooding. Um, these are just things that may affect the reliability if you're relying on these North Coast sources that are pretty far removed. Um, from the local treatment plant. Um, you know, the city is undergoing a, an EIR for and a change petition with the state amending its place of use for the San Lorenzo water rights and maybe some other rights too. Um, and at this time, you know, we're the agreement covers just the North Coast s sources, but we understand that the agreement also wants to look at the long term opportunities. So we have been meeting with the city um, over the course of that EIR um, preparation so that we're in uh, advised of what's going on. Uh, in the meantime, I think the city in their own um, planning has looked at upgrading Graham Hill treatment plant for more uh, flexibility for their own use. Um, so that's a positive that will make these disinfection byproducts and total organic carbon decrease um, so that's nice to see that work being planned. I mentioned we always need to have our wells um, on standby, ready to go at a moment's notice um, for multiple reasons. Even say a natural disaster where the city may need to activate the inner tie and reverse it. Um, we want to be able to, to react uh, quickly. Um, this last couple bullets talk about the flow rate and we'll go into that a little more. but. Generally, oh, takeaway is that it was reliably meeting about a thousand gallons a minute, which does equate to about 1.4 million gallons a day. Um, it's driven by a pressure drop between the two agencies, and the larger that um, pressure difference, the the more flow can come through. 
Um, you know, we are purchasing this water from the city at an agreed price that is listed in the um, um, purchase agreement. Um, we do understand that it, it may need to be increased uh, after if we move on to a longer term agreement. Um, this is a temporary pricing structure that is made to answer questions and not get in the way of doing that. And so we appreciate the city is also sharing costs of all the water quality testing, all the reporting. We're, we're partners in this 50-50, so um, we do appreciate that partnership. Uh, the last two bullets just talk about, you know, we're not exempt from Proposition 218 or 26, and the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act does not allow us to do um, a wholesale thing and bypass that. We can't, sub or the city cannot subsidize um, other customers. So we're nearing the end of the, the presentation here. We do, I'm circling back, the, the range of flow rates is driven by that pressure differential and it ranged between 800 gallons a minute and up to even 1400 when, um, you know, the demand was low on the city side or their boosters were not running and our tanks were low. Um, we, you know, I think Dr. Daniels mentioned that we were, we are still um, trying to resolve our ammonia challenges at the O'Neill Ranch well. And so, you know, we, we may be needing to operate that well as we try to resolve that issue. We had an unintended um, experience with electric rates and when PG&E, when you sign up for an electric rate, they kind of expect you to use a certain amount of electricity and when you don't, they penalize you and therefore we saw some significant increases, 700% of Main Street, 250% at Garnet, um, because they sort of hoped that you'd be doing that. So we're not sure if we can overcome that, whether you can flip flop um, over the course of a year, winter, summer thing, but it was something that I don't think anybody forces, you know, looked out for. We, the district, has right now applied for another permit amendment for this upcoming winter. The current one was limited to the restricted area, and so we've worked with our local uh, Division of Drinking Water representatives to amend another uh, permit for that. We did already send out notices, and I know some of you probably already got them. I hope those of you in sub area one and two have received a postcard. Um, we did send out about 10,000, and we know that that over notified the area affected. Uh, I don't believe we've received any phone calls. As well, maybe one inquiry, one email on my side that I did respond to, but mm, maybe you I've have got a few a more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are trying to target, and we've talked to the city reps about when we could start, and their water situation may allow it to begin November 1st. We already began the sampling that we talked about, although it did not include the tanks, but we can grab a sample before we open in November 1st. And uh, as already stated, we're uh, anticipating that we can hopefully transfer up to about 300 acre feet this winter. Last slide, so thank you for bearing with us. There's, of course, the quantity question, and we wanna just recognize that we're gonna try to work as to, to together to get as much as we can. Um, we are also pursuing other options and it doesn't mean that this will be um, not looked at. We will look in parallel. We've always wanted a, a diversified portfolio, so we will do that. Um, we just can't, can't count on it to solve our basin deficit that we've been looking for and, and so we're doing it as a benefit, it'll, d it'll help supplement. The, the price is right now set at $1,000 per million gallons, which is about $326 an acre foot. We're working with the city to, to learn what that might be over a longer period as they're legally constrained to do so. And then of course this, as Emily presented, most of the water quality results look favorable. Um, we are gonna monitor disinfection byproducts and the, the hydraulics 
the logistics of moving water seem to be um, not a limiting factor at these levels of this amount of water. So we anticipate that we don't have to make many changes in order to, to bring this next phase into play. So, any additional questions from the board for Emily, Rosemary, Heidi, or myself or Christine? Can I, can I just make one comment? Um, I, I know that you've heard and we've probably heard some of the same kinds of things that, you know, we're not, the, the organizations ought to work together. And I just want to pass on something that happened uh, the other day when we were all dealing with the public safety power shutdown. Um, on the the city was shut off on um, all of its San Lorenzo sources, um, Coast Pump Station, the treatment plant, and the um, Felton Booster. And as we were on a Loch Lomond at the time that it went down, Felton Booster was necessary to push the water up over the hill to get it to the treatment plant. Um, at the time that we started to um, get the plan, and you guys, were, where everyone was getting, you know, notified, you guys asked us to open the inner tie to send water to you on an emergency condition, which we were able to do. Uh, simultaneously, we uh, had an interaction with the people in the San Lorenzo Valley Water District and loaned them a generator, and also because they were down a couple of people because some of their folks were conveniently out of the country at the time that this all happened. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> we offered them, you know, uh, backup people in the event that they needed it, and then we checked in with the uh, folks in the, um, in the Scotts Valley Water District to see how they were doing and whether or not they needed anything and, you know, got, had a lot of conversation back and forth. So on the, I guess that happened on the Wednesday, on Thursday, I had an interaction with um, Jan Swigert, who's the Division of Drinking Water person that we all work with. And I kind of gave her a little update on our situation and then passed on sort of the status. And back in, we had a couple of backs and forths. But at the end, she said to me, She'd always been impressed with how the water agencies in Santa Cruz County work together to support each other. And I think that that was a really great example of the kind of collaboration, communication, coordination, and really uh, you know, focus on getting the job done on the behalf of our customers. That from my perspective happens every single day, whether we're working at the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, at the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency, working back and forth to address these kinds of issues. So I think that uh, you know we have an exemplary functional relationships here that really ought to be celebrated and acknowledged. And you know, somebody who lives in Monterey and deals with whatever she deals with, wherever her the rest of her territory is recognizes that even if we don't always see it. Great, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. um, and you had a question, I had Michelle. I a question, now I gotta remember what it was. Um, oh, just to be clear, nobody in Aptos gets this water, right? N not yeah. at this time. Right. Oh no, that's not That's why I, no, cause, cause I didn't get a. Sub area two would include part of Aptos. Yeah. If it went to sub area two. Yeah, yeah, where, which right. part of Aptos are you talking about? Basically right. not east of Soquel Creek. Right. Or um, Aptos Creek. Right. Aptos. Yeah, that's that would what be, I was talking that's about. That's not feasible. But definitely the concentration will reduce as you go further and further to the east. And that's right. You might get you know a, a smidgen of the water, but not a whole yeah, well, lot. We like it. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, so no other questions from the I, board. I actually have yes, a question. So the transfers are limited right now by the North Coast um, stream volume that you take. But the, you've, there's an EIR that's being done to, for water rights transfers? Yes. So, so let me um, make a couple of clarifications. The transfers are limited by the available resource in the North Coast source and the CEQA document that was done for the pilot project, gotcha. which established the time frame that we could do this between November 1st and April 30th. Okay. So, whatever's on pieces of paper that show water coming in in August doesn't matter. Or uh, whatever's on pieces of paper that might show you the state of our current uh, Loch Lomond storage doesn't matter because Soquel Creek is not in the places of use of any of our San Lorenzo River rights. So until the uh, EIR on the water rights changes, the pet change petitions are finished, which we're hoping will be about a year out, um, 
we do not, we cannot take water from storage out of Loch Lomond and send it to you. That's a real world constraint that yeah. we can't, we, we won't um, violate, let's put it that way. Right, but if that water right goes through, then yeah, what then, happens? then I think that there's opportunities for changing the volume, changing the, the not the so much the seasonality because I think that uh, there there are more concerns. Uh, the the San Lorenzo is sort of close to additional appropriations between I believe it's May first and the end of October. So you know there's sensitivity about the flows for habitat and other kinds of resource management issues. So I think that we would still largely be providing water uh, in the winter season, which is when you know we would be right. looking at. Uh, aquifer storage and recovery also, but I also think that uh, the one option we put in there for the um, for the annual, you know, uh, 1.4 million gallons for the, the capacity, the 1,500 acre foot strategy we looked at, it did assume that we would basically be delivering water under the San Lorenzo River, River water rights and that that amount of water would just become part of our demand, right, that we would just be serving you Mm -hmm. um, 1,500 acre feet a year, 1.4 million would just go on top of our demand and and we would plan that into our um, operations. But you can't do that now. Right, but and you might not be able to do in the future if there's not enough water right. in dry years. Yeah. And then we have limitations on what we can take, right? Right. I mean, that that's the other piece of it that we can't give you more water than you can actually than your customers are actually using in this strategy, because it has to go someplace. Right, and our our water our customers don't use as much water during the winter time. Of course, two point two point three two point four MGD. I think we've got a, a quick question too. I mean, in specifically to this uh, coming the cu coming transfer, how the climate predictions for the coming winter might affect that if it, you know, goes, well, the rainy season's supposed to begin in November. Right. It, this is always the dicey part, right? It's trying to figure out where we are. And I think that um, because we've had, a, this has been a wetter year or 20, wetter year 2019 was in the wet category. We've, we've had more base flows, uh, particularly in the North Coast sources than we might've had in other kinds of years. Um, so a lot happens to look at, you know, we have to look at the fish life cycle, the actual flows that are net required, and we won't be able to tell that really until closer to the time. But I think our goal would be to try to make sure that we can, um, you know, as soon as we can, that we get this going because it's good for you, and I think it does help us understand more about what it will take to do this well if we want to continue. And some of the some of the climate indicators are not positive. Um, there is no El Nino um, sitting out there waiting for us. In fact, it's cold water off of the Ecuador. And um, in addition, um, there's a as you pointed out at an earlier meeting, there is a warm blob out there, which is the thing that caused the 2015 drought to happen. So yeah. that could be a factor as well. But if, if you're a believer in whiplash weather, then we're due for a dry one after a, a wet one. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? So just to remind people, that most of this is informational, but we will ha we also are going to be asked to, um, you know, accept the, accept the, the, report. the report, but not, after, not until after public comment. Yep. Okay. So now it's time if anybody wants to comment on this item. Thank you for these good reports. Thank you for being here this evening. And um, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of Aptos Hills. I wanna commend the district on being so cautious about mixing of these two different water sources. Um, it's unfortunate it took so long to get there, but I appreciate your caution. So I've read through this report and I found it very interesting. I remember that um, barely two weeks into the water transfer last winter, the district did turn on the O'Neill Ranch well. That came as a bit of a surprise to the city water commissioners. And so I want to ask, uh, because I know that the O'Neill well has high 
ammonia, and therefore um, I think your district has a waiver uh, for some disinfection byproducts. Could that have been what caused some of these high disinfection byproducts that you're seeing during the water transfer period? Because the O'Neill well was on. Um, I also want to point out that the, um, the amount of water predicted that would be used, 165 acre feet last year when you could have taken 300. I suppose that that partly was because of the restriction on the, uh, the demand level, but also because you turned on the O'Neill Ranch and the Main Street well. But also the city did their ASR time. ASR pilot project, and I remember hearing that you were asked to, to turn off the transfer, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put out misinformation. So the reading through the document, the um, projected uh, customer demand is based on the 2015 levels. And what I see in your records consistently is that your demand is down from what it was and continuing to go down. So um, please don't let it seem like this will not work because it, your demand is gonna be bigger and I hope that it does in fact supply a lot of area too. I wanna point out also uh, that um, in terms of monitoring before, some of the metals were not tested, were not monitored until almost a month into the transfer. Cadmium, things like that were not, um, uh, tested, and some of those actually decreased um, in levels uh, during the transfer over what they were afterwards. So please pay attention to that. And um, hardness uh, improved while the transfers were on, so your customers must have been happy about that. Um, there's a lot of information here, and I want to just mostly say um, the temperature also decreased. The transfer water was two degrees colder. Thank you. That's good. That doesn't support bacterial growth. And I would like Thank finally you. to ask uh, Ms. Menard, while she's time here, please speak about the impending lawsuit from the North Coast Your people time is up. that d Dr. Daniels brings Excuse up me. almost every time. Ms. Steinbrenner, your time is up. Oh, thank you. Colonel Terry Maxwell, a rate paying customer of the SoCal Creek Water District and a concerned informed citizen and resident of the county. Ms. Menard, I'd also appreciate you addressing the concerns Ms. Steinbrenner brought up and her inquiry regarding the North Coast lawsuit issues. If you could uh, evaluate, uh, if you will elucidate that and the position of yourself and your office in the city regarding that for the attendees who've gotten, who've come here, those of us who've come here. Um, in addition, I, referring to page 108 report, um, and I'll address this to anybody competent to answer it. Results from the pilot water transfer matched chlorine decay bench scale testing showing a more stable chlorine residual in the district's sources when compared to the chlorine residual in the city's treated water. I think I know how the chlorine got in from the city's water with the treatment, that may be the way, but could you explain the content of that sentence again? The pilot water transfer matched the chlorine decay bench scale testing showing a more stable chlorine residual left over in the district sources when compared to the chlorine residual in the cities. Can you explain, Ms. Menard and Mr. DeFore, that differential, why? Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, that ends the public comment period for this then. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, thank you, I'm Scott McGilvray. I live in Live Oak. Um, this has been a very good hour here. Appreciate hearing about the cooperation. I think it's real. Um, I um, I don't have any quarrels with anything that Rosemary says, even though I tell you there's water available on the North Coast. Um, the permit that we have at the present time limits it to the period of November through April, but it could change. 
Um, I want to suggest in the spirit of moving forward here that this board respond and let the city of Santa Cruz know, preferably in writing, but if not in writing, or maybe both, come to the city council meeting. It's the 12th, 13th of November, the joint meeting of the Water Commission and the city council. It's a Tuesday night. Okay, it's pretty soon come and express the desire of Soquel Creek water customers to take more water. It'll help us get you more water. There is water. <laughs> you know, it, it may not be here in the models, but it's here in the rivers and it's here in the Loch Lomond Reservoir. And it isn't going to help us in the big picture to be at 90% at Loch Lomond as the rainy season starts because we can only accept 300 million gallons. We're all better off if we take advantage of the stormwater capture component of the watershed above Loch Lomond and let that go down to a lesser number. And I don't want to argue about the number. But if we had more capacity to catch the water that's going to come, whether we are ready for it or not. Um, yeah, I got a minute left. So I, I want you, particularly this board, this group, because you still are laboring under some misconceptions. Uh, the, the conception that there is no water. There is water. Uh, and this water from the North Coast is going to be replaced by San Lorenzo water. So there's going to be water available one way or the other. So let's get on with it. Let's get on. Let's figure out how to get the water through your system, Taj, out to where the groundwater wells are that you're worried about from saltwater intrusion. We really need to do this. This water goes down the river and it goes away and it never comes back except in rainfall someplace on the earth. So no complaints. Um, I look forward to more thoughtful work on how we can accelerate and take advantage of what we have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, seeing no one else, we'll close that portion, the public comment period. And I think the city's aware that we want to cooperate and get as much water as we can um, as we get into a longer phase project. So I think we've sent three letters on that uh, yeah, subject I think, already. I think that's pretty clear. Um, but the ongoing communication is continuing. So, um, accepting the report. I move we accept the report. I'll second it. I think it is very, yeah. it is very informative. Thank yes, thank and you. thank you guys for Report coming. Thank you for the honorary too. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. All right, thank you. And then, <laughs> you guys don't have to stay, you know. <laughs> Unless you want to. If you want to, you can. But we, That's we, all right. I may have a see. water loss so I'll just report at my house. I'm all good. <laughs> okay. I can collect our So we Thanks have. For coming. Yes, thank you very much. We have a couple more things. We have um, management update next. We'll go back to 5.1. So the page is um, 75 of 148. Thank you. Matter of fact, um, management report. Oh, we're jumping back to the management. Well, Cut. I don't want to forget. Yeah, yeah, we should do that. Anything. Um, let's run through this. Let's pull it up. Um, management report. Can you go to that? And who's first up on the management report Would regarding staff? Con conservation. Okay, why don't you exchange, and then Shelly can come up in a, at last if we need to. That's fine. We're gonna do engineering first. Sounds good. Sure. We've been busy. We've been building a, a site over at uh, the Granite Way well, and we anticipate it looking quite finished in the next three weeks. So Sounds if good. you're driving in, a, in, in Aptos, stop by, take a look at it. The ornamental fence is up, um, and the site is getting ready to be paved so Good. the well pump will be going in at the uh, the end of this month 
We will have a little slight delay with PG&E as usual, <laughs> um, but we're hoping that we can move up the six week delay um, as quickly as we can. The Wharf Road main relocation that uh, was a consequence of our main from the 60s being too close to the sewer, la uh, sewer main is basically complete. The, that work was basically finished today. They made the final tie-in. Uh, I think paving is scheduled for Thursday. Um, I don't have any, I mean, you've received a large update on the surface water purchase, so I don't need to dwell into that. Um, any questions on the status report for me? I just had a quick question. I couldn't remember the s the one two three TCP. I know you'd said the designs on everything's on hold, ba awaiting a legal settlement. Can you come what was the settlement waiting for? Well, it's just our Can't day in call. court. I think it's just a long list. Yeah, well, the, there was a resolution, but only with one minor player. Right, but then there are two. Is it awaiting settlement with like Shell and yeah, Dow chemical? chemicals? That's right. Okay, all right. And apparently they're doing global settlements of some sort now. 2021? Yeah. Okay. If all right. Needed. Federal court. They're not quick. Okay. Moving along. All right. Thank you, Taj. Um, Shelly? Jumping back to custom conservation custom field. Additional things I wanted to mention, there's um, the official water conservation guide that um, we uh, contributed to with the Water Conservation Coalition, this is something that Vi uh, really put a lot of effort and focus into pulling this together from all of our partners in the county, and it's got a lot of great information in it about um, how to check for leaks, how uh, we can help you with rebates and um, WaterWise house calls and other services as well as a lot of information about water supply. So it's a really great document. Um, I would encourage everybody to take a look at it. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, stormwater recharge. So after this report was prepared, uh, there's been a, a new development. We found out that there is some potential grant funding um, up ahead and that a grant application needs to be submitted by, I think it's December 15th, if we're gonna go ahead and, and try and pursue those funds. Um, we're gonna be bringing back to the board at the first meeting in November um, information about that grant and what it looks like in terms of what the district might need to contribute in terms of cash and staff time and some limitations that we see with that and just getting your input on whether you want us to pursue those funds or not with um, our partner, the county. So just a couple uh, upcoming things. And then I'm gonna let Bob, um, do you wanna talk about SB 13 or do you want me to? You can just summarize it. We're gonna have a staff discussion about it anyway. So SB 13 is some new legislation that the governor just signed related to accessory dwelling units and um, the ability to continue to charge water demand offset fees for those units and also some changes to uh, metering requirements. So we're gonna be working on that with Bob and trying to distill what that means to us and our programs and come back to the board in November with what that looks like and, and get your input on that. Okay, sounds good. Relative to the grant for stormwater, it would be good to know kind of the cost of, of what we want to do because getting a, a grant for this and we have to spend that to yeah. So. yeah so we're going to be working on pulling that together what is the next phase of work look like in right. terms of cost and what would what's the district being asked to contribute uh, what are other people able to contribute in terms of cash and, and, and time services so. good. okay thanks great thanks Shelly um, next would be Christine if she's here uh, yes I'm right here there um, you are so uh, in addition to what I have written there, I, as we all know, we experienced our first public safety power shutoff by pg and &E last week, and um, we first came aware of it Monday morning, and it was really uh, uh, all departments within the district came together to prepare for this. Um, and it was also um, 
kind of an emergency action that we also experienced with our customers because we got notification out to our customers um, starting on Monday with emails and Tuesdays with calls um, and then also some barricade signs to ask for uh, a, a stage five uh, water contingency uh, measures be enacted. Um, as you all may have heard that there were uh, pretty significant communication issues with PG&E which included us. Um, I, their email and text notifications kind of left um, something to be desired, um, but I do have to say that the list of our impacted facilities that they gave us um, was correct. So nothing more, nothing less um, lost power, um, which was very helpful for planning, although if you looked at the maps, that was th those were completely inaccurate. Um, I do have to say that uh, I think about four facilities uh, earlier, like last year and then earlier this year, they had emailed us our list of sites that would potentially be impacted. Um, and that was not really what we experienced. Um, we, some of those sites that were uh, on the list, we did not lose power and there were also sites that we lost power that weren't on that list. Um, so all in all, uh, at about Wednesday night at around 11 p.m., we lost uh, power to 27 of our facilities, um, which is 71% of our facilities. Um, and what's interesting is like 15 of those um, had, were not classified as being in uh, fire threat areas at all. Um, and eight of them were in the elevated fire threat areas and which is defined by the CPUC, and then uh, just four tier three extreme fire danger sites were added, but there were uh, multiple other tier three sites that were we still had power to. Um, we had uh, six uh, standby generators that uh, were operating and they all started as uh, expected. We had previously tested them and made sure they were topped off with fuel the days before. Um, and we had, we only had to deploy one uh, portable generator. Um, and as Rosemary mentioned, that we, uh, the, a really big help was being able to open that inner tie because um, we lost power to two of our major wells in that service area one without the ability to put generator power on those wells. Um, and then of course O'Neill um, is inactive or not inactive, but we're not using that right now. So we were able to uh, use our McGregor, McGregor pump station, which didn't lose power, and then uh, disperse that water through service area one and two. So it was a really big help. Um, oh, and then one, uh, I have to give a huge shout out to our customers. Uh, the, we started to see a decrease in demand on Tuesday and on Wednesday and then on Thursday when the power which was out, I had to double check the numbers to make sure, I mean, it just looked amazing, but they, uh, our production was down by 40% on Thursday. So it was amazing. So. Several people asked me like, how long could we using generators keep our, keep supplying our tanks? Um, well, right. basically it's a dance of getting enough fuel to the generator. So that, um, with this power, with these set of uh, uh, power outages and being able to rely on the inner tie, we would be using about 350 gallons of fuel a day, of diesel a day. So then, so that would be basically mm -hmm. someone full time running around and filling up generators. Okay. Um, different other scenarios with without using the inner tie and um, different pump stations that we expected to lose power, but we didn't lose power, then that could uh, that number can go up to like a thousand gallons a day. And that's um, really, uh, we've got a, a, a fuel trailer that holds like 500 gallons a day. Um, we might be having to travel out of the area to, to fuel up because those the gas stations were, would not have power. But that's gonna ask. Um, so it all comes down to um, fuel. fuel. Okay, but the tanks will last couple days um, if people um, are it depends on the on the tank um, the one tank 
uh, the booster station did lose power, but we didn't have to put a generator there because that actually has about four and a half days of storage. Okay. Other tanks, we you'll need power to, you know, we need to run those pumps every day. Yeah, um, okay. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see. Um, there she's coming. <laughs> there she is. Hi Jones. Um, I know Christine did a shout out to the customers, but I also want to just do a shout out to you. During the um, power shutoff, um, Christine came back from vacation, so thank you for oh. that. Well done. Um, I'm just going to hit on two main items tonight. Um, the first one is I did want to introduce Skylar Murphy, who's standing right here on my right. Hi, Skylar. He was he um, has been hired by the district to be our water resources planner. He's a local from Aptos, um, and Tom, I don't know, maybe you recognize uh -huh. him. I do recognize okay. him. <laughs> <laughs> um, after after um, going to high school here locally, he went to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo and got his bachelor's degree, and then traveled down to Santa Barbara to get his master's in environmental science. So he will be assisting the district on a full-time basis on issues related to the community water plan and pure water so kelp project um just a couple things to note skylar did do an internship about five years ago um, in the conservation department so he is a familiar face to some of us here at the district um, and just uh, for fun and relaxation um, we I just want everybody to also note that he does like to do um, mountain biking rafting and surfing so he has a little bit of an adventurous side to him as well um, so hopefully when you guys are in at the board, uh, at the district office, you guys can come by and see him. He is sitting in the main office with us. Okay, welcome. welcome, Skylar. Yes. I just want to say thank you and look forward to the opportunity. It's going to be really exciting. Yeah, good. Um, the, just the other thing that I want to note is that um, Carla and I went to the Pure Water Monterey ribbon cutting event uh, a couple weeks ago, and we did talk about that at the standing committee meetings, and we showed some pictures of that, so that is uh, in the packet. Um, it was a very nice event. Um, a lot of people showed up. They had some um, project supporters standing outside with signs that had said, I heart uh, Pure Water Monterey. Um, the Pure Water Monterey project is going through um, a development of an EIR for expansion of the facility. We also got some materials that um, were from that ribbon cutting event. What was also nice about that event is that they had some elected officials speak to talk about the project as well as um, project funding uh, sources. So they had representatives from the Bureau and also from the state. And the last thing, I guess I did have three things. The other thing to note is that um, Ron has been invited to speak on a panel um, on October 23rd, in addition to Andy Fisher and also Meredith Goebel, um, to speak about seawater intrusion along the Monterey Bay. Is our groundwater too salty? And that is a lecture series that's being conducted by the Long Marine Lab. Thank you. I just also wanted to thank you guys for doing the um, Waterwise Academy. You know, we got Bruce and I got to have lunch with the people that went to that, and it's just. I think it's really great, you know, the effort you put out and the and that the community members put out to come and learn. So, so thank, thank you, you for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, and the, for those of you not familiar with the third name, Meredith, I forget her last. Well, oh, it's she's, from Stanford. she's from Stanford University. And okay. With the Rosemary Knight. She worked. Yeah. Okay. She worked on that study. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. And then uh, finance. Yeah, I'm gonna. Pinch hit for finance and human resources. I'll start with human resources. Uh, while I think Skyler being new, uh, Greg back here, who was introduced last week, our water quality expert, is uh, hired in September. Now you're no longer the uh, newest member to the uh, team. So I just want to recognize and thank you for staying all night. Uh, you can see by Tracy's report here on HR, uh, we were really fortunate to. Um, uh, be able to promote two of our hardworking people, uh, Justin and Eric there, so we're really proud of them. And there's more work going on uh, back there to you know, fill in positions when people get um, promoted, and they, they really seem to be clicking. So another shout out to 
Christine and Troy and just the way they're working there. To go back up to finance, uh, just one thing to be aware of, um, we do have a, a, a little uh, cybersecurity training, so you may see an email every now and then, and if you click on it, and it, it may warn you that you shouldn't have clicked on it, and uh, <laughs> it's a, that's a good thing. Uh, it's, it's fooled all of us at least once or twice, so uh, we're really working on that. I think a main thing to note here is that uh, third bullet item under finance, 14, over 14,000 notifications to our customers. So that's a testament to our new billing system, being able to do that, send out text and phone calls. Just think about the time that's saved from people having to do that. So it's a real plus, really getting that message out uh, with banners. I know uh, Melanie's team did some banners. We did this website. So, and again, I just, I mean, our customers uh, responding to our plea of stage five with, uh, you know, 40% cut back like that. I know it's not something they wouldn't endure very long, but they did it and they got us through. So we'll always, you know, we, we always be grateful for them. And that's another thing that uh, that exercise did. Usually we do tabletops. We take emergencies very serious. You know, it was a year ago last night, I think the pro uh, the earthquake happened 30 years ago or something. It's but this, what this does when we, instead of just doing tabletop exercises, like when we have a PG&E outage, is it enables us to connect with our customers and interact and, and do it full circle. So that's, that's critical to really get it right. So that's those two reports, and we cruise down to uh, general, manager. general manager. So a couple things there. Uh, find it on my notes. Yeah, this report caught my eye. It's, it's by the Initiative for Global Environmental Leadership. The end of wasted water, a revolution in reuse is underway. It just, you know, I looked at the report. It's by out of Wharton University and uh, Suez and this initiative they have. And one of the sentences that struck me was, I think it's the third one down, they say it concludes that as a species, we'll have to learn to use technology and political will to put an end to wasted water. And it goes on and it has, it, it put some numbers in there I thought were interesting as far as impact to the uh, community as far as uh, GDP, gross domestic product. Pretty staggering if, if my calculations are, are correct there based on their numbers. Um, what else? There's a new book. I thought I was going to order it, but I'm going to wait till it reduces down on Amazon. I'll probably buy a secondhand copy like I usually do. Plus, I got to get through my first 10 books that are sitting on my shelf. <laughs> the, um, this is called Trouble Water, and what stuck out about there, I, I, so I haven't read the whole book, but the, I put the full book review in there. And, you know, we forget, it says here, through those scientists are still studying the health effects of too much sodium in drinking water. Early research suggests it could lead to hypertension and chronic kidney disease. disease. You know, I, I was in the risk assessment field for a long time, and we think about chemicals like, you know, disinfection byproducts and things like that, but just sodium it's a, it's a bad character so we need to keep it out and it's even worse for plants um it's a good little read there if you go through it they really um that book really touts orange county in the sense that uh that they think where the all water's headed through that type of purification system basically the last thing on there is a, a guest commentary by uh miles Ryder. Uh, CEO of uh, Drisco, uh, and I hope everybody got a chance to read it. It's really what we're, you know, one of the heart of the things we're all about, and that's protecting our groundwater and our future. And it's it's about seawater intrusion in the Pajaro and just the, the our region. And it says there's no that starts out there's no single greater risk to the future of farms in California. Um, the single greatest risk to the future of farms in California is a severe lack of water and goes on and talks about seawater intrusion being part of that. So uh, that concludes. All right. My um, so any questions from the board on the management report? Any, any public comment on the management report? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I don't particularly have a comment on the management report, but I wasn't given an opportunity to comment on any of the other reports. May I do that now? Those are all are that, that all is together. Oh, thank you. It's all, all one right. report. It's the oh. different managers of the different departments. Part departments. Thank yeah. you very much. I understand that now. Thank you. 
Um, I have a comment, and I did write your board about it in the engineering department. Um, the fence around the new Granite Way well is aesthetically pretty bad. <laughs> that was an issue that the We Are Aptos group brought before the county and the developers. Uh, because part of that uh, phase, that de design development, was to relocate your well there. And that was one of the big questions. But there was no information that could be given, and your district didn't even show up at the, the Board of Supervisors hearing on the complaint. So now to see it there, it is higher than even what the project specifications say. In the project specification, it says that the fence will not be, will be eight feet tall, and that's how tall the electrical box is. It's higher than that by about a foot and a half. And the um, concrete uh, foundation around it makes it a rather imposing thing. So I don't see any um, landscaping plan for this. And as one who has to go by it every day, I think um, many people would appreciate some attention to making it less imposing. I also want to ask about the quail run tank, which says construction pending funding in 2020-2021, but I have looked on your website and it says that there, was, uh, there were bonds sold in 2013 to pay for this project. So I really wonder why, if it's at 100% design and ready to go, why don't you just build it? when you took the money out in um, debt in 2013. Um, also in the engineer's report, I have a question and I also wrote you about this on the landscape plan for Twin Lakes Church. Um, that's a lot of plants in that little space. And I granted uh, 19, 16 or 19 oak trees were removed, but to put in 17 oak trees and um, 150 other plants, many of them trees, I th I'm really wondering what is going on there. And um, to say that they're native shrubs, that's not true. Uh, Fortnite lily and Australian fuchsia are not native. So um, I would like to do um, like some clarification on that. And also I find it unusual that you would pay an arborist $300 to check the quality of the nursery stock that a very reputable contractor, which I think you've gotten bids from, would, would uh, submit. My last time here, um, the water distribution model has not been done since 2014, but is required to be done every two years. And it uh, seems to be put on hold again. So. I'd like an explanation about that. And I guess uh, my only other question is, is the AMI problems with um, you. Please be material respectful. not being transmitted time and unacceptable levels of please data. Please unacceptable levels of data. Thank you. Okay. This is on the management report. Yeah, on the management report, I endorse every comment this time but are made every item of concern. Oh, and I think you should direct your management to, in writing, respond to her concerns and post them and make them available for interested customers and impacted residents of the county. I'm serious. You don't hold your management accountable for addressing things that Ms. Steinbrenner and others have brought up tonight that are exceedingly relevant to you doing your jobs right and meeting your sworn duties. If you won't do that, leave the board. Next is District Council. Yes, um, we'll be working with Shelley this week on the new ADU bill. In addition, <clears throat> there was a case decided by the Supreme Court in the last month on um, inverse condemnation. You may recall I told you that there was a case in Southern California where a water district was held liable for a fire because some wiring wasn't correct in a pump station which resulted in not being able to put out the fire and they ended up paying something like, or JPIA ended up paying $72 million to settle that case. The Oroville case that just came down from the Supreme Court would tend to limit the inverse condemnation claims. This was a case that was a sewer situation where the city had a requirement that you have a backflow device, for lack of a better term. Whenever a manhole is lower in this, down the street, than where your house is located, so that if there was a blockage 
and it backed up to your house, this device would, typically it's a ball that rises and lets the sewage go out in your yard as opposed to your house. Some dentists had a backage back up. They didn't have this ball device, but they asserted that the city was responsible because the city hadn't maintained the sewer. And the dentist won at the trial level and they won at the District Court of Appeal. And the Supreme Court said no, and they actually reversed an earlier case out of Palo Alto saying, look, it's got to be inverse, it's got to be the primary reason for the problem. And the primary reason for the problem here is you didn't follow the city ordinance by putting in the backflow device. So that may have an impact on future claims against water districts in fires. So I thought it was very interesting. And that was the, that was the California Supreme Court. Thank you. Um, we have one last item, item 6.4, the water loss audit. Yeah, and Shelly, Christine, and Alyssa are going to present this. And as you walk up, Alyssa, please come up. I just want to say um, something you won't get from them. One of the reasons I think we were named as one of the top workplaces in 2019 as a district is because of the kind of thing you're seeing here. Even though Alyssa works directly with Shelly and the Conservation Customer Service Field Office, uh, having the ability for employees to do cross-functionality and help other uh, uh, departments is, is just a wonderful thing in many respects. And so she lent a hand to help uh, uh, Christine in this situation since Greg is just new at the district and, and that's the, the Carla used to nice. do that job. So I just want to thank you for that and, and both of y'all for lending each other staff back and forth. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll try to be quick since it's our uh, last item of the night. Um, so this is just an informational item about the 2018 water loss audit. Um, and so just a little background is that every year the district is required to submit a detailed report of our water losses to the Department of Water Resources for the prior calendar year. And this information has been required since 2016 and it's going to be used by the State Water Resources Control Board to develop standards for water loss to be applied more widely to other urban retail water suppliers in the state in future years. And this year's water audit um, was for calendar year 2018 and we submitted it to DWR by the deadline of um, October 1st. And uh, we prepared this report using the American Water Works Association methodology, which fundamentally assumes that all drinking water can be accounted for either as consumption or as loss and that that loss can be calculated using data that we collect from our system and by using some informed assumptions about inaccuracies in metering and billing. And so as part of the audit process, we compile comprehensive information on the volume of water from our supplies, imports and exports, consumption, water we use in operations and maintenance, and more basic information um, about number of connections, operating pressure, um, system characteristics. And in addition, every category of information that we enter into the audit also gets a data validity score. And that is based on the quality of our information. So how well are these things metered, um, tested, how often are they tested for accuracy, and how well do we track things? And so the results of the 2018 audit are shown in attachments one through four. Um, and overall, we're pretty satisfied with our results. They do compare pretty closely to our results from the last two years. And if you um, go to the second table on page three of the memo, um, that compares us on some key performance indicators to um, our results from 2016 and 2017, and then the median value for um, other California urban water suppliers. Um, and so we can see that in comparison to the median, we're doing um, fairly well on some key metrics. Um, those really are the kind of our, the major goals. So decreasing non-revenue water, um, decreasing water losses, and accurately tracking and accounting for the water that goes through our system. So um, the audit did identify some areas that could be improved to increase the validity of our data. And those include changing the configuration of our flow meters at some of the wells and 
implementation of a regular meter testing program. Um, that being said, our data for these things aren't necessarily deficient, um, but changes to them statistically would have the biggest impact because those are kind of our biggest values that go into this calculation for um, the audit. Um, one thing to note is that our infrastructure leakage index score, is, which is a measure of how well our distribution system controls real loss, um, is below the threshold that is deemed reasonable by um, AWWA. Um, our value is 0 0.73 for 2018, and they consider anything under one to um, be infeasible. So this is based on a national leakage survey, and it's unclear how well it's suited to systems in California, uh, which tend to be a bit newer. Uh, we can see that since the, this information started getting collected in 2016, um, approximately 28% of other California um, urban retail water suppliers had values less than one, um, including us and uh, the city of Santa Cruz. Um, the water loss performance standards have not been finalized, but the framework is proposing requiring additional documentation for utilities that are considered to have infeasible um, infrastructure leakage index um, or may require that those utilities use an alternative figure that they deem to be more realistic. Um, we don't necessarily think that our data is inaccurate um, and believe that additional data and analysis <coughs> is required on California utilities specifically before standards like this should be set um, or any enforcement measures are decided upon. So we do plan on submitting a comment to the State Water Resources Control Board with these concerns. And just wrapping it up, um, looking forward, we will take the results of the audit and analyze what the benefit is um, in implementing some of the changes that they suggest. And um, we're gonna be following closely the progress of the water loss performance standards and um, setting up our processes the best we can for the next audit um, for 2019. So um, no actions required on this item, but I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Well, I'd just like to say I, I appreciated this report and, and the work that went in behind it. Uh, and it's good to know that we're doing so well that any of these uh, re regulations that the state board might put in place probably will give a pass to us because we're doing so good. And that's mm -hmm. good to know. But I do, did like the suggestions for improving because, you know, we can always keep getting better. And I think that's good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, would we sometime during the year maybe come back with, like, what would it take for us to improve those things? Like you know? budget time? Yeah, budget time maybe. Right. Um, at least speaking from my department's uh, part of this, the um, uh, installing new flow meters that we have that has been a proposed project for the last several years and it just hasn't made the cut. Okay. It's always on the possibility list. Mm -hmm. And then it was the other was the meter inaccurate. What meter testing. Meter um, testing. And that's okay. something that uh, is in the future for the customer service or co conservation yeah. customer service field department. Um, but there's been other priorities. So we, yeah, but that seems like a good, good thing to make sure they're sure. all accurate. So with with those suggestions, would the data validity score go up? Is that the, the idea? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, our, our score um, is well within the upper 85 percentile of that. So if. No, I, it's okay. good now, but it right. can get better. Yeah. yeah, and if your data validity score ends up too high on these, um, that's when they start to question whether your, your information is. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like nobody can do yeah, that. Yeah, having yeah. a range between 50 and 70 is um, very normal. Okay, great. Um, any public comment on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, thank you for the report. I heard a similar report at the Santa Cruz City Water Commission and learned that old meters spin more slowly and you actually lose a lot of revenue because of that. 
city of Santa Cruz is looking at possibly $1 million a year because of that. So I had a question on page 145. This table has no units. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the unbilled, unmetered consumption of 7.890. I don't know what the units are. And the unauthorized consumption of 2.708. And then the customer metering inaccuracies of 10.037. I don't know what those. They're in millions of gallons. Sorry? Millions of gallons. Millions of gallons. How do you know that? Because there are numbers for our district. And I know what our num numbers are, and it's about one third of ours, so that would be okay. a conversion. Could, term. could that be added to this table? Because it's not clear to those who are not as familiar with your material. Thank you. So I want to ask about the unbilled, unmetered consumption. Um, it's quite high. And I remember that uh, Mr. Stumbaugh, one of your ratepayers, and I came to you multiple times and reported to you that there was an unauthorized connection with the Aptos Village project during its construction time. And nobody looked into it. It, it took a long time to get anybody to look into it. And the construction project was using unauthorized, unmetered <laughs> water. And I want to know if that affected perhaps your higher um, infrastructure leakage index of 1.0 in 2017, which was about the time that the Aptos Village project was using unmetered, un authorized water for the entire construction project for almost a year. There was also another unauthorized, unmetered connection in my neighborhood. On, um, it's technically Redwood Drive that had a two inch, one inch to two inch pipe that was going somewhere up in the hill, I suspect to a pot farm <laughs> that had been there for a very long time. And I'm happy to say that when I brought that to your attention, it was quickly destroyed, but there was a lot of water that potentially went through there. So um, I would like a little bit of discussion about what is unauthorized consumption and what is unbilled, unmetered consumption, and how do you measure that? Thank you. Is there any? Colonel Maxwell, I endorse Ms. Steinbrenner's comments entirely, and I'm not unfamiliar with what she's uh, basing them on. I am appalled as somebody who's you take my money for water to pay for the management here, to pay for all you're responsible for to your ratepayers who are like stockholders in a corporation, as well as voters and citizens you own an obligation to. One of the obligations you owe is to have your monthly retained lawyer, highly paid and done so, initiate an action against the Swenson construction people regarding the Aptos Village project, which you also shouldn't have approved the hookup of, but be that as it may, Ms. Steinbrenner reported to you earlier, and so did others, is my recollection, about the Swenson builders stealing from the rest of us with unmetered, unauthorized, and unpaid for water. And you neglected, you neglected your obligation to hold Swenson accountable. You neglected to direct your lawyer, or your lawyer directed his professional obligations to you and the ratepayers to collect money from Swenson to confront them. Why were you so negligent? Why has your lawyer failed to do his professional obligations to me and every other ratepayer to stop Swenson from having stolen that water and to not address them having to refund the money to us all, compensate us all for what they stole from us? I'd ask Mr. Basso to explain why that hasn't been done. Okay, seeing no other public comment, um, that is an informational item only. This meeting is now adjourned. We do. Would you like to make a comment on the closed session? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos, and the petitioner in pro per acting on public benefit, not just my own complaint. Um, regarding uh, an item you're going to discuss tonight, uh, case 19CV00181. Again, I want to um, point out to you that I don't understand why um, 
the costs are so high. I don't understand why we cannot sit down at a table and possibly work this out. Um, I do not understand why your um, attorney from Best Best and Krieger has to fly up every time when the Santa Cruz County Court System has the court call ability for her to call in like many attorneys do from out of the area. Why does she have to fly in every time? That's expensive for you and your ratepayers. And the four ex parte hearings that I've brought forth are not because I've been trying to delay things, because I've been trying to make you pay a lot of money. It's because as a pro per litigant, I see them as real issues. Uh, one of them was the Twin Lakes Church project that was piecemealed essentially from the larger project. And Director Daniels even gave inaccurate, erroneous information and defended it, which your board had to then take action to um, make an exception and change the law or ch change your, your plan to allow generators at the site. Another ex parte action I brought was about your rates that were being instituted to pay for the project that was the very, is the very heart of the legal action. And my last one was to ask to vacate the very strict, compressed briefing schedule that I am now being held to that was imposed by Judge John Gallagher, who within minutes of imposing the, uh, to hold those, those briefing schedules, recused himself because he had done so two years before when John Cole brought a case to you. He recused himself then voluntarily, but he never said anything about that. I found out from John Cole quite by accident. So that's why I brought this, the, the fourth ex parte. I'm trying to work very hard to get a fair and impartial trial. That is my constitutional right as a citizen to have fair and impartial civil due process. It is what you would want too. So I'm not being frivolous. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you so much. And this meeting is now